Here we are, folks, at Chicago's world-famed century of progress, the spectacular fair that was started by a beam of light from the star Arcturus. People from every corner of the world came to see its magic and its marvels. No less than 22 millions of them came swarming into this colossal show to witness the brilliant handiwork of its modern, unparalleled ingenuity. Here is the famous avenue of flags, a beautiful flag-bedecked boulevard, every foot of its magnificent concourse filled with an endless stream of pleasure seekers. In gay attire, full of the holiday mood, keying their spirits to the glitter and sparkle of their surroundings, eager participants in the sweep and glory of a show unmatched in the annals of fair making. Like a sentinel commanding the sun stands the Hall of Science, saluting the waters of the shimmering lagoon. It is a typical example of the regal architecture that is to be found everywhere on the ground, creating, together with its companions, a skyline of glowing monuments to beauty. Look at this dazzling performance of architectural effort, a symphony in steel and stone and glass, a tribute to structural perfection. With its graceful lines and commanding pylons, it offers a vivid modern contrast to an age-old Maya temple nearby. These majestic records of artistic achievement are to be seen everywhere. Visitors flock by the millions to drink in their glories. Following one upon the other, they create a picture that enthralls the eye with their sweep and majesty, a gorgeous climax to this vista of blue-green lagoon. Seen from the deck of a launch or across the rippling waters, this group makes an unforgettable impression. Visual music with chords of rainbow hues, the dream of the artist come true, the hope of design made real. Mingling with the brisk tone of modern America, we find, too, the spice and flavor of the foreign. From Europe and the Orient come resplendent roofs of gold, exotic reminders of different times and civilizations, adding their individual touches to the scintillant pageant that has made the World Fair such a unique adventure. Once it was Ferris Wheel, but today it's the towering sky ride that offers the major thrill of the fair. These towers rise into the sky to the dizzy altitude of 628 feet. And what a view visitors got from the windows of these rocket riders. Traveling across the lagoon, one saw far below the fairgrounds in a molten glow of brilliance. Blues and reds and greens and yellows, all fused into a blazing kaleidoscope of color. Truly a fairyland of light. And now back to Earth. Here we once more are on one of the main avenues of the fair, amid that never-ending tide of humanity, pounding along in search of excitement. Forty-four million feet, dog-tired and aching, but who cares about weary feet with all that whirl and glitter beckoning us on and on? To pause before this map-covered dome, the back view of the exhibit, a million years ago. Let's go around front and take a look. Here's King Kong himself and two of his gentle playmates entertaining the midway crowds. But this is only one of the countless bizarre and fascinating displays that made the midway a perpetual Mardi Gras of frolic. The midway, chief artery of thrills, city of million lights and spectacles, a blaze of flaming color, of sights and sounds and hurly-burly, teeming with magicians, sword swallowers, dragon rides, alligator fighters, Egyptian hotcha girls, sideshow wonders, a midget village, and what else do you like? And rivaling this conglomeration of freaks and fakers are the bazaars from Belgium, Germany, France, Holland, and other countries. Enticing, with great bustle and ballyhoo, the curious visitor with their strange and tempting wares. And of course, no midway is complete without a few spine curlers. And here's our old friend and thrill maker, the roller coaster providing heart throbs and spine chills up plenty. All kinds of visitors came to the fair. Here is Admiral Byrd's flagship, back from its adventures in the lands of snow and ice, to take a dominant position in the aggregation of queer craft and roaring planes that came to roost on the waters of the fair. In Panorama, the north end of the fair presents a vista of sheer beauty, a glamorous setting for that galaxy of architectural gems. Seen from above, their commanding grace is clearer than ever, casting over the scene a compelling note of progress, breathing forth the true meaning and spirit of this world's fair. Colors, tones, shapes, all sharply etched in brilliant design, a harmony of effects that captivate the mind. 
And now we come upon a most unique structure, the travel and transport building, presenting a dominant phase of industry in its most commanding aspects, a triumph of architectural design and balance, bold and austere in line, it serves as the symbolic landmark of that section of the fair dedicated to travel. And here is transportation in its most modern, thrilling expression. The Temple of Champions, with its clean-cut lines and splashing fountains, mingling beauty with utility. A proud symbol of the world's century of progress, stressing in particular the most universal mode of individual transportation. In the shadow of this modern architecture, Crowds come daily to see how cars are subjected to acid tests of endurance. This miniature track, with its 45 degree side banks and its saucer turns, is the proving ground of car performance. The pit in the center, affectionately called Death Valley and Punishment Pit, subjects a car to a grueling examination of fitness. It looks as though something is happening. Let's go down and see. Here is a real surprise. Harry Hartz, national racing champion and daredevil of the racetrack. No fashion shows for Harry. He's going to show us the real points of this thoroughbred. All right, Harry, let's go. He's off in a smooth getaway, and now watch him go. 35, 40, 45, 50 miles an hour, zooming madly around the track, having the time of his life. And these mobs watching him are getting one grand thrill. Listen to those tires screech and scream as he takes the curves. Look at that car hug the road like a beetle. Could a racing model do better? Here he comes again on the far side. Watch out. Oh, that was Harry up to his old tricks again. Beautiful balance to that car. Did you see him take that 45 degree incline? Just a little of the old racetrack fever. Here he comes again. And again he takes that thrilling tilt. I'll say that car has balance. I can see now why she was chosen the winner. And now watch Harry come down the ramp. At full speed, here he comes. Sally, what performance. He must be awfully confident of that car he's driving. And now he's away again, burning up the track with smooth, unadulterated power. Here he comes down the ramp. What's up, Harry? Oh, a trick. Stopping in the middle of a hill. He must have perfect brakes to get away with that. Now do it at full speed, Harry. And there he tears. Hell bent for horseplay. Up, down, stop. Nice work, Harry. No swerve, pitch, or brake throw. Those brakes must be good. And now he's speeding into the home stretch and pulls up on a dime. Hands off the wheel, a beautiful ending to a grand performance. And one sweet car, too. Nice driving, Harry. What now? Two more speed boys. Well, we're going to pause there because Harry obviously has good brakes. You think they would probably check that before... They actually did the video shooting. Something didn't go well, right? But I wanted to introduce this premiere involving this featherweight, showing you kind of the culture of the times. The Chicago World's Fair that started in 1933, ended in 1934, was the century of progress. And not only did they show cool cars that Harry was driving, but they showed other things as well on that incredible line of innovations that were a part of that time in the 1930s. And one of those displays that we would have seen if we had had the opportunity to be there, boy, wouldn't that be fun, is we would have seen a large display by Singer featuring the machine that we're going to be looking at today, the Singer Featherweight. That was the big debut of that machine, uh, along with a lot of other progress that was indicative of that century. So let's get some lights on, and I want to take you through some progress shots. I haven't done this in a while, taking you through progress shots so you can appreciate what that century of progress unveiled as far as the featherweight. Now, does anyone, anyone that's in the live stream right now, and this is our second live stream today. Talk about busy, busy, busy. But it, does anyone already own a featherweight or featherweights? Anyone at all that's in the uh, live stream right now? Just curious. 
All right, let's change this first of all. Yeah, we'll put on a little bit of music. And pop over to these pictures. Several featherweights for Emma, huh? Wow. I better unplug this one. Well, what you're looking at in this opening shot, and like I said, this project was was multifaceted. This project involved uh, restoration for the case, for the machine, and not just you know mechanical electrical stuff that was done too, but the entire look of the machine. That's why I decided to title this like a previous video sometime back. Beast to beauty, beast to beauty, because she really did look more like a beast than a beauty uh, in the beginning. And I should explain that this particular machine belongs to Julie Hankfitz. And uh, she's out of Wisconsin, specifically from Rhinelander, Wisconsin. If anybody for fun wants to Google Rhinelander, uh, you'll get an idea of what her community is all about. It used to be totally off the radar. Rhinelander was an, a no place, and now it's a go place. Has really become quite a tourist spot. I know this because as a boy, my dad used to take us fishing up near Rhinelander and that area. And the, the most vivid memories I have of that area is the mosquitoes that were about as big as small dogs they were huge and uh it was always a mixed feeling going up there because it was great to be with dad it was great to go fishing the adventure of not knowing what we would catch on some of those small lakes in northern wisconsin and then the dread as the sun would start to set and we were coming back to shore in the boat and you could just see the mosquitoes waiting near the shore for you, licking their lips. I don't think mosquitoes actually have lips. But you know what? If they did, that's exactly what they were doing. Because, oh my gosh, as soon as you would hit that shore, your arm would go from uh, kind of a pale white with a little bit of sunburn to looking almost like you were immediately sunburned. But it was row after row of mosquito just nailing you. And, of course, my dad, being a retired Marine, would just say, oh, you know, they're not going to eat much. Just leave them alone. Well, yeah, that didn't go over so well with my brother and myself. But, at any rate, it was what it was. And the memories are still great as far as spending that time uh, with dad. So this is one of the clasps that, when this machine was brought to the workshop by Julie, it had a rope tied from one side to the other. Uh, in lieu of a handle, and it was just shrouded in uh, lots and lots and lots of rust. And we'll look at more, more shots of this now, hopefully. Eventually. Oh, wait a second, I went too far. I was clicking, I thought it was the same shot, but it wasn't. That was the before. All right, I'm... I've, I've done a lot of live streaming today, so if I'm a little bit out of my game, just understand. So this is before, this is after quite a bit of cleanup to get that, that brass looking brassy again. I look kind of like I'm half awake, half asleep there, but at any rate, that's just a shot of me for fun. No, that's kind of how the case arrived. It's not really... 
it's not really characteristic of what you would expect to see a featherweight getting carried in. You know what I mean? It just isn't. It's got a drabby look. It's got a worn, tattered look. And the rope doesn't do a lot to complement it, along with what I think was a maybe a, a twist tie or something. I didn't know what that was about. More cleanup on the case. That was my initial focus, was trying to get that case looking at least semi-presentable. Semi-presentable. Getting rid of that rope. I think I think we can do without the rope. I don't know about you. Working on the other side now. Trying to get those layers of rust and crud off of there. You know, the case is really the first impression of the featherweight, isn't it? You got to at least make it look semi-presentable. Starting to work a little bit on the case now, which is kind of a vinyl covering. Now I've added a handle to it. It's obviously not an original leather handle. Uh, those are really hard to come by, and a lot of them are in poor condition with the leather drying out on them. So I decided to go a different direction. And in the end, it actually looks really good once the cases get some rest restoration to it as well. And there I'm using for some spots that are all the way down to nothing. I'm trying to fill those in a little bit with a combination of a permanent marker. And then I also I've got a, a fabric safe type paint that I'm going to build into the mix as well to try to get those areas looking a little bit nicer. Again, it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to help. And there I am with some of that fabric soft uh, uh, paint. Or I'm going to try to fill that in and just blend it in a little bit better. And it's starting to come step by step. But it's a process, isn't it? There, it's starting to blend a little bit better. And now, at least from a safe distance, <laughs> it looks good. It looks a lot better. And that's going to present that featherweight and give a good first impression before that featherweight is taken out of the case. And there's good old Tom Sawyer. Only a couple years this was done in 1936. And again, the Chicago World's Fair, where the featherweight was unveiled, was between 1933 to 1934. This was just done a couple years later. And who knows, maybe Tom Sawyer and the fence was somehow inspired by the century of progress. Because they're definitely making progress on that fence, aren't they? And it's just a slow, methodical process trying to improve the look. And getting rid of the rust on the case really will help quite a bit. So little by little on the clasps, on the top and everything else, we're working our way through the rust field. That's really, it just consumed this case. I don't know. I, I didn't ask Julie where, where this case was stored or if she bought this from someone, where they had it stored. But it obviously was, was a moist, rich environment. Does that look better? That's the after. That's the before. Looks a little different, doesn't it? And this is, again, a, a service that you wouldn't get at a local sewing back. It's not a service that you would get at a local sewing center. Uh, this level of restoration, but when you're dealing with the princess of singers, as I like to refer to her, I like to go all out because that that customer has invested a lot of money generally in getting that featherweight. And it really is, especially if they're going to be going out to quilting retreats and, you know, going to those hobnobs with fellow featherweight owners. It really is a point of pride, isn't it? And that case is the first thing that they see when you're going into one of those settings. Just a general cleanup again on those clasps that should really be a kind of a showpiece. These are kind of like the jewelry on the case, aren't they? It's looking better already, step by step. That presents a lot differently than what we had before, doesn't it? 
And then we, we have some damage to the case as well, where the material is actually separating, it's torn. And I'm going to try to mend that up a, a little bit as well and just make it a little bit more presentable and also preserve it. Uh, this initial process is really more preservation than it is restoration. And if you look at that clasp on the back of the case, that's that's riddled in rust too. Everywhere. Look at that. And that again is not going to present this, this featherweight well. It's not going to give a good first impression. So step by step, we're going to get that cleaned up as well. Fill in some of those bald spots on the uh, the case and get that looking a little bit more presentable also. And there I go with some of that fabric safe paint. It's not going to be an identical match, but I can diffuse that a little bit by using a diluted uh, conditioning solution to try to blend it in a little bit better and make it a little bit better uh, looking, a little bit more presentable. That one's a little bit out of focus. You don't need new glasses. <laughs> the camera must have been jostled a little bit when I did that one. Again, trying to mend the case a little bit and just make it nicer for Julie. Tacking it down and then starting to blend it in as well. And I love my dental tools. All of you know that. I love my dental tools and the ability they give to reach into those hard to get spaces. And doesn't that look quite a bit better? Patina is one thing, but rust is another. Rust just doesn't complement much of anything, in my opinion. That's looking better. Yeah, that's it. There we go. Kind of looking at the back of the case, seeing what we need to do there. More mending to be done. And that's the only problem when they use that vinyl that thin vinyl covering on cases, whether it's a featherweight case or anything else, inevitably the glue underneath fails and it starts to separate and then it becomes vulnerable. And then generally it starts to uh, crack or tear. Looks like I painted my thumb a little bit too, doesn't it? Starting to fill it in. And again, it's not a perfect match when you start, but then you can use a solution to, to uh, diffuse it a little bit and it starts to blend in just a little bit better and look a little bit more presentable. All in all, the impression when you look at that case now is a lot more favorable than where we started. And that really was my goal is just to do that cleanup and, and preservation, a little bit of restoration on the case uh, as well. And there it is after I've done that preservation, restoration, a little bit of workshop magic it's sitting next to uh, Jody's uh, 1800 machine uh, on one of the schoolhouse tables that I have in the workshop. And it just, it just, it's ready now, isn't it? It's ready now to become a partner with that featherweight that also is going to get restored and preserved down in the paint shop. And then we can marry those two together. And when Julie walks into a place with this featherweight, the case, number one, is going to give a lot more favorable impression than it did when it was really, really tattered and worn and rusted. And then when she pulls that featherweight out, which we will see soon enough, boy, oh boy, is that going to create a great impression. And that's full circle. We've gone full circle as far as those initial pictures of that featherweight case. Now, I don't know if this is going to load or not. This has been sitting for a long time waiting for me to be ready for it. But I would love to be able to show you some of those before pictures of uh, the featherweight itself. Boy, if this will load, I really, really want to show you those. <clears throat> it's trying to load. Slow but sure. I'm going to refresh that page real quick. Put on a little bit more music while we're waiting for this page to load. Well, I hope all of you have had a good day. I know that some of you may have been in the earlier 
live stream as well. We had a really big turnout for that in the middle of the day where I was showing you, I was showing you a couple of things really, but it was just kind of a, okay, it's, it's thinking about loading. It, it might load, it might not. Ugh. Internet is just an imperfect thing, isn't it? Look at that. It's not loading any of that. Try refreshing it one more time here. <clears throat> so what I did earlier, and I had to actually, this page isn't available right now. Boy, that's kind of spooky. Jiminy Crickets. Well, we will try to get that loaded, but it's not wanting to load right now, obviously. It's telling me the page isn't available right now, which I know it is. I know it is. Poor Emma, poor Emma is in the live chat all by herself. And because I'm involved in trying to get this silly thing to refresh, she's basically having a conversation by herself. <laughs> Emma's such a trooper. Yes, she is. All right, I'm just going to close that. It obviously is not happy. We'll try to open it fresh and see if I can somehow get it to work that way. Because I really do want you to see the contrast. I want you to see the contrast if possible. There it is. But you know, that's when you do a live stream, things like this happen, don't they? Things like this happen. Come on. Oh, this is frustrating. I may just have to give up on this. Maybe maybe something's wrong with the connection. It's thinking about loading, and that's about as far as we're getting right now, is thinking about loading. So I've got to give up on it. What I'll do is... I will, in the description of this live stream, I will post the links for all of the pictures that show the condition of the featherweight before it went through the paint shop magic. And this particular featherweight, I was able to preserve the original paint and the original decals. So we're going to be looking at this featherweight. It has, it has not been repainted. No decals have been replaced on it. And, uh, you know, that's that's the ideal approach, isn't it? When you can preserve something instead of restoring it and replacing the paint and everything. So, oh, I didn't turn on that other light. Hold on a second, you guys. All right, there we go. So I was going to show you the pictures of the featherweight before... It went through the restoration because it was really, really gritty looking. It was a very, 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 very dirty looking princess of singers. But instead of being able to do that, I've got to just show you what's in front of here first, and then I'll just unveil it. I've given up on trying to get this page to load, that's for sure. Let me try it. So what I have here initially is some of the sew-offs I was getting from this machine when I first sat down to it. Um, the balance was way off. 
the quality of stitching was nothing to, to boast about. And part of that was I'm dealing with a very different thread. And there was an also there was also an issue with the Pitman arm on this machine as well that was causing the stitching not to be full. So even when I was setting it on six to seven stitches per inch, I was getting about eight to nine. And so that had to be dealt with it as well. This was a major project to say the least. So I'm going to throw those to the side. Nothing to brag about here. It's just a basic uh, featherweight foot controller. Interestingly, when we did the unboxing earlier today on the FOF 230 that came from Alabama, we discovered that someone had set up the FOF 130, which has a 1.3 amp motor with a featherweight style foot controller like this, the Bakelite style one, which is only rated for 0.7 amps. And so I, I explained in that live stream, if you didn't catch it, you can check it out. I, I explained in that live stream that this type of foot controller is definitely not compatible with a FOF 230 or a lot of the vintage FOFs that are going to have the larger motors. Foot controllers should always have a larger amperage tolerance than the motor itself. So if you have a motor that's 1.3 amps, that foot controller should probably be rated for about 1.5 amps, which this is not. But this works great for a featherweight. And then I have a, a reprint of the manual. Uh, the original featherweight manuals, as you probably remember, are super teeny tiny. And as we get older, they're really hard to read. So I ended up uh, enlarging the original featherweight manual and reprinted it, got it professionally bound. And this is really a great resource to folks you know, if they want to be able to enjoy the manual, but not have to strain quite as much to see what's going on inside of the manual. You know, essential things like how do you orientate the needle? And obviously on the featherweight, we're going to put the flat side of the needle to the left when we're setting it up. And that's different than a lot of the Singer uh, models that we would see on this channel. So if you're setting your featherweight up, just make sure you put the flat side uh, to the left, and then you're going to be threading the machine from right to left. And uh, But at any rate, if you ever have a need of an enlarged, um, not an enlarged prostate, wasn't going there, <laughs> but if you, have, uh, if you have need of an enlarged featherweight type manual, um, I've got this available. You just reach out and, and we'll work out uh, the particulars of that, okay? And the only other thing I had over here to the side is I had this auto zigzagger that I've shown on this channel before, but it's reminding you again that any of the Singer straight stitch, lock stitch style machines, which includes the featherweight, you can get one of these auto zigzaggers and take your straight stitch only machine to a point where it can generate a number of ornamental type stitches. And if nothing else, it can generate a zigzag, which until they came out with this automatic zigzagger was really... You know, no one could have imagined that you could have taken a machine and put this attachment on, and then you add these different cams uh, that would have been available with this auto zigzagger, and then all of a sudden, your straight stitch only machine is able to do a wide array of stitching, which is really kind of exciting. I don't know if I'm going to demonstrate that during this premiere today, uh, because I've had a long day of live streams already, and I can always save this for another straight stitch Singer machine and show it to you again. Otherwise, I've demonstrated it before on this channel and you can search for that because it's, uh, it's a cool thing to see as it manipulates that material uh, in lieu of that needle bar being able to swing. Uh, this does the swinging for it, which is really neat. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to back the camera up a little bit, try to get it lined up reasonably straight. There we go. And before I jump into this any further, I'll see if I need to say hello to anybody. Nope. No one's come out of the shadows except for Emma. So all of our other friends that are part of the live stream right now are live stream right now are, are kind of hiding back in the shadows and that's okay. But I hope you step out and, and make yourself known so we can welcome you. Emma can welcome you as well. That would be cool. All right. 
So without any more fanfare, because we kind of had fanfare at the beginning clip of that video of the Chicago World's Fair, I'm going to show you what this machine looks like now. Gosh, I wish I could show you those before shots so you could really appreciate how far it came. But again, those will be in the description, so you'll be able to check it out. So slow but sure, here goes, lifting it up. And I know we're a ways out. I'll obviously get closer to it, so don't worry about that. But the Featherweight, again, is one of those machines that it's got to be a good-looking machine. You know, a lot of cleanup done on this case, which really has improved the look of it dramatically. It's not perfect. It still has its scars. You know, like on a sewing machine, scars on a case show that that case has been going places. It's been taken out. It's It hasn't just sat in the corner of a room and the featherweight has just been on display. Uh, this is a case, wherever Julie got this featherweight, it's been a case that has been out there and, you know, obviously going to places and being used, which is great. I'll show you on, side, on the inside of the case. And of course I had to off camera and I've got to cut some of this real quick. Uh, off camera, I had to sew some of this saddle grade leather with this featherweight because a lot of people still don't believe that the featherweight can sew leather, but it can. And this is only about three to four ounces. I could have doubled this easily and sewn it with this featherweight. And then all of these attachments, if you, if you follow things at all on Facebook, all of these attachments over here now were just riddled with rust. They were just rusty, 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 including this extra bobbin as well. And also the key for the case was also riddled in rust. And again, you're not going to get this level of service at a sewing back or at a, you know, a sewing repair place or something like that. But I went through and I individually polished and I showed all this on Facebook and I'll post those pictures again in the description for this live stream. But these all were hand polished and then I also coated them in a solution so that they're not going to go back to rusting right away again. So I think that that matters quite a bit. And then down at the bottom of the case, we have an original oiling can, which is always kind of fun to get those original things. I doubt that Julie will use this, but it's kind of cool to have it in the case uh, as well. And Singer came out with a special little clip. So you could put it right in the bottom. The featherweight slides in right next to it. And then you've always got that oiling can uh, available. So again, the case is not perfect, but it sure is a lot better than it was uh, in the beginning. And now uh, Julie can carry it uh, with this handle that I replaced on the on the case instead of using uh, the rope that she had, as you saw in a couple of those shots. So I'm going to get this out of the way. I'm going to get this out of the way. And let's get closer to this featherweight so you can see what she looks like now. I think that she represents being the princess of singers, as I refer to her. She looks a lot more like the princess of singers than she did in those before shots that you'll be able to see in the description. All right, I'm almost there. And I think I'll have to move this up a little bit as well. And the thing Julie didn't know about this uh, particular featherweight is this particular featherweight, as we'll see when we get a little bit closer to it, is a centennial version. And she didn't understand that. That kind of goes back to what I said in that live stream earlier today, that oftentimes people that have vintage machines have gotten them from family members that have passed away. And they don't know the significance of that machine or the attributes of that particular machine. I'm actually going to put my little DeWalt jacket on. It's, it's kind of cool down here. And tomorrow on Friday in Wisconsin, in April, we're supposed to be in the 30s. So if you're in a warm place, 
you could probably rub it in pretty good right now because tomorrow I think we're supposed to hit a high of 36. Oh, hey, Eddie. Eddie stepped out of the shadows or just joined us. One of the two, I don't know. Always good to have Eddie here. So, again, the before-after would have been a lot more impactful if you had seen what this machine looked like before. But, again, without harping on that because the Internet is not being good, uh, I'll just say that when you look at the before shots that will be in the description, you're going to be like, holy cow, what a transformation. It really did look more like a beast than a beauty, but she definitely looks like a beauty now, doesn't she? And you can see that badge of honor that marked the 100th year of Singer, that centennial badge right about there. If I move it a little bit more, you'll be able to see it, hopefully. Maybe I'll turn my little light on, too. Yeah, the light doesn't help. That actually kind of messes it up a little bit. But the centennial badge was marking that 100-year anniversary from 1851 to 1951 when Singer was celebrating their centennial birthday. And that's kind of the cool thing as well. When you look at how this machine was originally introduced at the Chicago World's Fair with the theme of a century of progress, a century of progress. And this featherweight was center stage for Singer as an example of some of the progress that had come over that century time leading up to that 1933-34 Chicago World's Fair. But as pretty as she is, the thing that really makes her incredibly majestic is the fact that she only weighs 11 pounds. And her portability is just off the charts when it comes to the ladies of the time in particular uh, not needing to be uh, concerned about hauling around a super heavy machine, but a machine that could be carried around as easily as a bulked out purse, which was pretty common back then. Purses were a big deal. But the featherweight, the featherweight should be a showpiece. I mean, that's really why she was brought on the scene. And uh, this one now, Julie will, this will be really Julie's first glimpse of it when she watches this, um, this live stream afterwards, because I don't think she's available right now to, to join us, unfortunately. But um, she knows what this machine looked like when it came to the workshop, and you'll see that in those progress shots. And boy, oh boy, is she a different look, different looker now. So, all right, blah, 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 blah. Let me talk to you about the setup on this machine today. The setup on this machine is, first of all, I do not have one of my one of my go-to 9014 Schmetz needles. I don't have a 9014 Schmetz needle in here because for the special thread that I'll tell you a little bit about, it did not recommend going with a needle like that. It recommended either a Microtex needle, which I don't have any of those right now here, or you could go with a size 11 embroidery needle for this type of thread. I'm kind of looking over my shoulder here, seeing hopefully you can see that in the shot. So when you're working with different specialty threads, and this thread is a specialty thread I believe it's out of Italy. And this is the kind of thread that Julie wanted set up on this featherweight. And it took a lot more adjusting, but I finally got it uh, to work really well. And uh, working with an embroidery needle, you already know, generally with embroidery needles, you're dealing with a thread that is a little bit more on the fragile side. The thread we're going to be working with today is 100% cotton. And it's got a special name. Let me see if I can pull this off real quick and actually show it to you because I'm not a, I'm not a master quilter like uh, Roz and like some other folks that might be a part of our circle on the Cow Country channel. But apparently this is really the go-to thread right now with serious quilters. It's called Aurifil, A-U-R-I-F-I-L, 
Aerophil, and it is rated at, I want to say it's like 30 weight, 30 weight or 40 weight. I think it's 30 weight. They have different weights of this stuff too. But this is, everyone is buzzing right now about this particular type of thread when they're doing serious quilting. So if you're a serious quilter and you haven't tried this stuff yet, you'll have a chance to see this featherweight sewing with it for the first time today. And then maybe you can go out and get some as well. But this stuff does, I was, I was correct. I, I, I hadn't looked at this thoroughly, but it does come out of Italy. And uh, again, it's a hundred percent cotton thread. So I found when I was trying to adjust the tensions on this, it was a little bit more prone. It wasn't as bad as that other thread that I showed you that is, um, what is that other stuff? I always forget the name of it, but it's 100% rayon. I think it's rayon, isn't it? Let me check. It's my little specialty drawer right here for threads. Yeah, I was right. This is 40, 40 weight, which should be pretty strong, but it is ridiculously fragile stuff. This 100% rayon is probably a little bit worse to work with when it comes to getting tensions right. It's beautiful. It's spectacular embroidery style thread, just like this stuff is. This stuff's going to be just a little bit, little bit more stable, a little bit less fragile, but not much. Um, I had a number of times where all I was trying to do is draw the thread back after I did a stitch line to check the balance of tension and the thread would break. So we might experience some of that on this live stream today where all I'm trying to do is rock the balance wheel and get that thread to extend out so I can clip it and we may have it break. And that'll just mean that I'll become very proficient in threading this feather white, very proficient. But it's a pleasure to get a, a machine like this where you take it from being a very beastly looking machine to becoming quite a beauty. And I think you can kind of see that in the shot as you look at the reflection of the bed. And I tried to make sure that the machine maintained some look of being used, but at the same time tried to restore a lot of those factors that just really detracted from it really took away the beauty of this this featherweight machine. And again, this is not brand new paint. This is original paint, a red, original decals. And um, so it's not, I mean, it's not ready for the Smithsonian, is it? But it certainly is ready to pizzazz people that uh, Julie will be coming into contact with because I doubt very much if their featherweights are going to have this degree of beauty and luster. And again, these are original decals as well. Yeah, she's a good looker, isn't she? All right, so let me move the camera back without any more blah, blah, blah. And let's do a little bit of sewing on this uh, featherweight using this uh, Aerofill thread made in Italy, 100% cotton. And uh, we'll see how this little princess of singers does. But you know what? If I don't want to hand turn it, I better put this foot controller to work, right? I better actually plug the machine in. And the machine came to the workshop uh, with lots and lots of uh, uh, challenges. And one of them that is easily fixed is it had an old incandescent bulb in here that was really crusty. And, uh, of course, I had to put one of the LED bulbs into it so that... It, you're, you're able to see the bed with such clarity now. It's just crazy. All right, let me get this plugged in. And this is an original Singer plug. I sometimes will replace uh, these, these uh, power cords for the, um, the Singer machines because over time... Over time, as this cord is flexed back and forth, 
you'll get a little break in here in the wiring, either on this side, that side, or sometimes even on the plug-in side, because the plug-in uh, assembly for the original Singer plug-in power cords is molded. You can kind of see that. It's molded, and as this is plugged in and unplugged, and it's bent back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you'll sometimes get a break just on the inside of the molding. And at that point, all you can do is cut the cord, and then you can replace it with, let me see if I can grab one. This is only one example of the kind that they have. And you can pick these up at any major retailer. Uh, if, if you start to get kind of a, a the lights dimming and, and you can tell that there's a shorting in there because the wire is breaking, all you got to do is just cut the cord and, uh, and then go ahead and use a, a, a replacement type plug and adapter like this. And then you can eliminate that factor uh, straight away. And they're very easy to wire. Um, I won't demonstrate that right now because the plug is good, but you can pick these up and then you can figure it out because you're very smart. And that way you won't have uh, a connection issue for the machine. But that's one of the first things I check when I see an original Singer cord Check uh, straight away to make sure that there's no shorting issues with it because it's pretty, pretty common. It's truly pretty common. All right. So let's see what that LED light looks like. And I've got that laptop so high I can barely see it. There we go. Oh, yeah. You kind of see it from the side because this is open right here, isn't it? I got to kind of cover that. And then you can actually see the machine. But we'll get a good camera angle, hopefully, where that, that isn't a distraction when we're using the featherweight today and we're stitching with it. So I know that I asked the question early in the live stream, and Emma was kind of on her own. But does anyone else have a featherweight? Anyone else? Any other featherweight owners already? Uh, in the live stream. Any featherweight owners? Oh, hello to Susan. Susan was uh, Susan was in the live stream earlier today as well. So she is getting brownie points for her dedication. Of course, Emma was here as well. And I think Eddie was here also. So it's cool to have folks that committed to uh, to being here. Okay, let me do something. I've got to cut a couple things real quick. Let me put on some music while you guys are waiting on me. Just bear with me for a second here. I'm going to put on a fun song called Barnyard Surprise. So it was all it's all dried up. Well we'll try it maybe anyway.
cutting a little bit of saddle grade leather too. I want to do saddle grade leather on the featherweight because there are folks on some of the Facebook groups that say you can't sew leather with a featherweight. So guess what? I always have to sew leather on a featherweight just to dispel that myth that some people are, are propagating out there. My problem is that stuff is shedding a lot right now. I'm going to have to get a different piece of uh, genuine elk hide. This stuff is just dried up. That's unusual. I usually don't see that. Okay. So let's do this. Let's go ahead. And again, this thread is a little bit more on the delicate side, but we're still going to try it. Plus, we're sewing with, if you join the live stream a little bit late, uh, we're sewing with an embroidery needle today by Schmetz. And uh, it's a size 75. You don't hear about 75s a whole lot. You'll hear the, the medium numbers like 60 and 70 and 80 and 90. But this is a size 75 used exclusively for embroidery. And uh, so it's, you know, it's generally, it's not going to be a needle that you want to select if you're going to be sewing two layers of uh, saddle grade leather. But you know what? Playing by the rules is sometimes a little bit boring, isn't it? So we're not going to play by the rules, and we're going to see how this featherweight can do with what is probably not the easiest of tasks. Let me see if I can line this up just right. I'm trying to get the right angle for you guys. There's a little bit of a reflection with this light. You can kind of see that. See if I turn the light off. Why don't we sew without the light on, if that's okay with you guys? I can actually turn my light on the camera. We need it. We probably don't even need it. Yeah, we don't need it. We'll sew with the featherweight light off. Again, the featherweight is wired where there are certain machines, when you turn the switch on for the light, all of a sudden there's power to the machine and then the machine can 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 be operated the featherweight is hardwired so it's going to have power whether we have the light on or not or off at least i hope that's the way i rewired it otherwise that'll be a little bit embarrassing won't it <laughs> then i'll make a what i'll do is i'll make a motor sound and i'll turn the balance wheel as fast as i can by hand so you'll yeah you won't be fooled you won't be fooled cuz you guys are yeah, you'll figure it out. Okay. So let's see how that angle is. Yeah, that's a good angle. So you can see what we're taking on is probably about eight, eight ounces or so of, uh, of saddle grade leather. It might be a little bit more than eight, but I'll just go conservatively with eight. Again, when they cut leather and uh, this particular leather, uh, Emma, Emma, who's actually in the live chat right now, actually picked this bag up let me show you guys she picked this bag up of leather remnants from some shop down in florida she's down around naples florida and uh she knew that i was always running short on leather so she found this leather place these are the scraps that they don't need and she mailed me this big bag of leather of saddle grade leather which is really cool so thanks again thanks again for that emma it's very very very, very generous for you to do that. But, you know, when they cut the hide of, a, of, of leather, whatever kind of leather it is, it's going to vary in thickness. So the top, the top piece of leather that we're sewing might be a little bit thicker, a little bit thinner than the bottom one, if that all makes sense, hopefully. Okay. So again, whenever you're launching with a sewing machine so you can get maximum launch, make sure that your take-up arm is at the highest position. That's part of the reason I couldn't see it. My laptop screen was angled wrong. Make sure your take-up arm is at the highest position and it's just starting to come on that downstroke. See that when I rock the balance wheel? The reason you want it to be like that is then you've got the mechanical momentum of the machine working with you. When it's on the downstroke, all of those pieces, all of those components inside of the faceplate are designed to sweep down with the least amount of resistance when that machine is sewing. So we're setting it up for success by being on the down sweep like that. Hopefully that makes sense. 
And I did not try sewing two layers of this saddle gray leather with the featherweight. So I'm hoping, number one, I can do it. Number two, that I don't break this size 7511 needle. I'm used to doing this with a size 9014 needle. So we're quite a bit, quite a bit smaller in size than we normally are. Okay, let me line that back up so we're actually pointed at the leather. That would be helpful, right? All right, and I'm gonna try to do this without a hand start, but I may end up having to hand start it because this is, you know, that's quite a bit of leather for a 0.4 amp motor to sew through. That came up in our, in our unboxing today. I got on the topic of featherweights talking about motor sizes and the fact that the motors on these on, on the FOF 230 that we were unboxing was almost three times the size of a featherweight motor. Again, 1.3 amps is the standard rear mounted motor that's on a lot of those FOF 230s. And uh, this featherweight only has a 0.4 amps. So you can do the math. Three times four is 12. It's actually even, it's a little bit less um, than a third the size of those FOF motors. But again, I went through this motor, I did some rewiring on it. So hopefully that's gonna be enough to get us to the finish line so we can go through these two layers and dispel a lot of the myths that are being circulated across the internet that featherweights can't, 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 never, ever sew leather. You don't sew leather with a featherweight, but we do it all the time on this channel, don't we? All right. So all of that blah, 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 being put the rest, make sure my clutch is locked and let's kick this in and see if we can sew through using this uh, Italian made thread. If you join the live stream a little bit late, I'm just going to grab it off the top real quick. We're sewing with this Aerofill thread. It's a specialty embroidery quilting type thread, 100% cotton. It's made in Italy. And this stuff is rated somewhere like around 30 to 40 weight. Um, I, I would be more inclined to say 30 weight because, like I said, I had it break a number of times when I was setting this machine up and doing some off-camera sew-offs, getting ready for this live stream. So we'll see how it does with uh, the embroidery needle, the Aerofill, blah, 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 and we'll hopefully we get through it. All right, here we go. Julie's featherweight centennial model going through two layers of saddle grade leather. Two layers of saddle grade leather. Here we go. Fingers crossed. And the thread did just break. Right at the end, the thread broke. Take a look. So this quilting or embroidery aerofill thread, again, probably around 30 weight, trying to sew leather of this thickness, that's our only obstacle, isn't it? The needle didn't break. Again, this is a size um, size 11 embroidery needle that we're using by Schmetz, but the thread could not withstand that. And part of that could be when you're setting up a machine like this to sew, you kind of draw that bobbin thread out. When you're sewing, uh, setting up a machine like this to sew, obviously part of my servicing is to uh, disassemble the upper tension unit, right? I take it completely apart and I do all the thorough deep cleaning on it to make sure that it's real nice and clean. Uh, part of that setup when you're first assembling this is to decide how much tension you're going to have on this take-up spring. The take-up spring is right here. You can kind of see that in the shot, hopefully. Looking over my shoulder. Yep. You can see that in the shot. You only want about three ounces, three to four ounces of return on this take-up spring. Because what this take-up spring does in the sewing process, if you ever watch it when you're sewing, it's going up and down. And what it's doing is that, is that knot is being created and that stitch is being created down in the raceway is it's sweeping up to pull that thread taut on the bottom of the material so that you've got a nice, firm, nicely formed lock stitch. Without this working, without this doing its job, you would have a real loosey-goosey looking lock stitch on the bottom of the material. And that's why as you're sewing, you'll see it going up and down doing its job. 
Well, on a lighter thread like this, that's 100% cotton, this Aerofil stuff from Italy, and it's only rated at about 30 weight. I think the customer told me 40 weight, but the bottom of the thread seems to suggest that it's not quite as strong as she thought it was. As this take-up spring is going up and down, it's putting a lot of stress. You can kind of see that as I'm gently pulling on it. It's creating a lot of stress at that point right there on the thread. See that where it's going up and down? Almost like you're almost like you have a fish on the line with the old bobbers. I don't know if we have any fisher fisher people. I almost said fishermen. If we have any fisher people in the audience right now, you know, when you used to go fishing, kind of like I described going fishing with my dad up around Rhinelander, where Julie is from, you'd always watch that bobber. And if you saw a little bit of a dip on the bobber, you knew that there was a fish messing with your bait, probably stealing your bait. Well, it's similar here, where as that take-up spring is going up and down very rapidly in the sewing process, it's putting a lot of stress on the thread as it's coming through the tension discs over here and then leading up to that take-up arm. That thread is getting a lot of tinsel pull on it, and uh, we pushed it a little bit too far sewing these two layers of saddle-grade leather. You see the level, level of sewing, the level of thread that we... Uh, the level of stress we put on the thread is what I meant to say on these two layers of saddle grade leather. The other thing that I didn't account for, and you'll see that a little bit in the stitching, is I didn't account for uh, increasing the presser foot pressure. When you have presser foot pressure that I had it adjusted for sewing cotton, you're going to get a stubbier stitch and you're not going to be getting that full six to seven stitches per inch you're going to be getting a lot less than that. The machine still managed it real well and gave us a beautiful page 34 stitch, but it's compressed because as the leather was being moved over the, the feed dogs and underneath the presser foot, there wasn't enough pressure to keep it moving evenly. And so we get a stubbier stitch at that point. And you don't want that when you're sewing leather. What I should have done is I should have increased the presser foot pressure up here, turning it clockwise to push down harder. Whenever you're sewing through multiple layers, whether you're quilting or whether you're doing leather sewing with a featherweight, you always want to bump that presser foot pressure up higher. Hopefully that makes sense because that way it gets a more even feed uh, over the feed dogs underneath the presser foot. So, all right, light back on. Let me get us threaded back up again. I'll probably take a break from leather sewing because I know that Julie is not going to be doing a ton of leather sewing with this featherweight, but I want her to know that she can do it because I know that she jumps on some of the Facebook groups and you get misinformation sometimes in those Facebook groups. You just do. Oh, Christina, Christina from Brazil has joined us, which is good to see because not today's live stream earlier today, but the live stream before that, she was saying that she wasn't feeling well. And again, because because we're a family and we kind of look out for each other, whenever someone tells me they're not feeling well, it always kind of pops onto my radar with a little bit of concern. Also, I'll mention to you, most of you know Doreen and Kevin from Iowa. They're oftentimes in live streams like this. Kevin shared, shared with me when he and I were communicating earlier today that Doreen was in the hospital or is in the hospital. So you'll want to think about uh, Doreen and keep her in your thoughts and prayers uh, as well. Kind of look out for each other. At least I hope we do. Okay. See if there's anybody else I want to say hello to real quick. I'll say real quick uh, hello to... R RJS7. RJS7. I'm not sure who RJS7 is or where they're from, but welcome. Good to have you here. And I didn't scroll up if there's anybody else that joined the live chat. Let me see if I can say hello to them as well real quick. Oh, hello to Mindy. Hello to Mindy uh, from uh, Las Vegas. I already had said hello to Susan and Eddie, and I said hello to, uh, I also said hello to Emma, 
And I also want to say hello to Minor, Minor 49er, Minor 49er. That's a fun one, isn't it? Welcome to Minor 49er. Okay, and with that, I think I'm caught up. If someone else joins and I don't say hello to them, then I'll put out a smiley face right now so that I can at least give them a smiley face, a big smiley face. There it is. Oh, and I'm glad I kind of lingered a little bit because we also have BT, BT Weedy or Betweedy. I'm probably mutilating that, but Betweedy or whatever that person is that just popped up. They're from Wisconsin. So how cool is that? Welcome. I always love to have, I love to have anybody in the live streams, but when I get a fellow Wisconsinite, a fellow cheesehead, it's always kind of cool. Yeah. So welcome to BT Weedy. B, uh, I, however you say your screen name, BT Weedy or Betweedy or whatever. It's a cool name. It's a very cool name. And Emma's already jumping in there to make you feel welcome as well, which is super cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. So welcome to everybody. And if you missed the intro, we actually started out. We started out at the beginning of this live stream at the Chicago World Fair, some actual video footage of the Chicago World's Fair that started, and a lot of people get this wrong. A lot of people get this wrong, but the Chicago World's Fair actually started in 1933. It started in 1933, and it ran so long that it actually went into the next year of 1934 and a lot of people will post it because it ended in 1934 they'll say the chicago world's fair in 1934 but it actually ran from 33 to 34 and the theme of that chicago world's fair was century of progress and that's what makes it really fun to present this centennial featherweight ce celebrating a hundred years of singer they were established in 1851, and then this bad, the special badge to mark the centennial year came out in 1951. And again, Julie, when she got this machine, wherever she got it from, she didn't know that it was a centennial featherweight, and that adds value to the featherweight quite a bit to have a centennial one. So, yeah. But anyway, back to our broken thread. <laughs> we sewed, if you, if you joined a little bit late, we sewed these two layers of saddle grade leather with Julie's featherweight. If she were watching with watching this, it probably would give her a heart attack because everywhere you go on the internet, it says don't sew leather on a featherweight. That's a bunch of malarkey. Featherweights are, are I call them a, pit, a petite powerhouse. They're a petite powerhouse once they're optimized, even though they only have a 0.4 amp motor. They're able to sew eight to 10 ounces of leather very, very easily and lay down some beautiful stitching. Although this stitching is a little bit compressed because I forgot to increase the presser foot pressure. I already talked about that. And that again goes back to the fact that I don't always do it right. I don't always get it 100%. But the bottom line is, oh, there's my rig down there. The bottom line is featherweights are, are made out of aluminum, right? It's an aluminum bodied machine. That's why they only weigh 11 pounds. You know, the net weight of a featherweight is only 11 pounds. And that's why at the Chicago World's Fair, starting in 1933 through 1934, they had a number of very beautiful women that were at the Singer booth. And they were in that classic pose, kind of like this, almost like a pizza. They were in the classic pose of holding the featherweight in the palm of their hand, flat like this, showing how light the machine was. But I've said this in other premieres because I've presented machines to you that are not made out of aluminum. They're made out of magnesium. And if anyone wants to Google, well, what's the big deal about magnesium, Scott? Why did some sewing machine manufacturers make their sewing machines out of magnesium, like the domestic sewing machine company? like the White Sewing Machine Company and a couple of other select manufacturers of sewing machines, instead of going with aluminum like this featherweight, they made their machines out of magnesium. 
Does anyone know why that's a big deal? Why is that a big deal? Why, why, why is that a big deal? I got to show off the shine on this bed a little bit, you guys. Shut the light off, too, so you can really see it. So no one's jumping into the, to the chat. Why, why would be making a, a sewing machine like this featherweight on a magnesium be even more impactful at the century of progress had they been able to do it? Yeah, and Emma's right. Magnesium is actually 33% lighter than aluminum. And yet the magnesium, even being over 30% lighter than aluminum, it's also stronger than aluminum. It's stronger than aluminum. So if, if, if Singer had made the featherweight on a magnesium instead of aluminum, it would have been even stronger than it is now. And it would have been 33% lighter, which means it would have been almost three pounds lighter. Instead of being 11 pounds, it would have weighed in a little bit over eight pounds. Kind of cool, huh? And I've, you know, I've reached out to Singer and said, why don't you, you made those really cool 170th uh, class 15 anniversary models to celebrate 170 years for your anniversary last year in 2021 why don't you consider doing a redo of the featherweight and make it out of magnesium so that then you could say it's like the ultra featherweight it's not 11 pounds any longer now it's only eight pounds that would really be brag worthy they never returned my calls i don't know why they never returned my calls So, all right, so let's get this featherweight rethreaded. Let me put on a little bit of music while I'm doing that, and then we'll uh, do some more sewing. Again, our setup is, our setup is we're working with a Schmetz embroidery needle, size 7511, so it's a size 11 or the European measurement equivalent is 75. That's kind of how that works. And then we've got this Aerofill 100% cotton thread that's designed for quilting and embroidery. So that's why when we when you sew through about eight to 10 ounces of saddle grade leather, the thread is very likely to break. We kind of experienced that, didn't we? Yeah. So again, when you set this featherweight up to sew, make sure the flat side of the needle is facing to the left, and then you thread this needle from right to left. And I'm gonna cheat and use my magnifier so I can see this a little bit easier. As our eyes get older, they don't see quite as well, do they? I might even turn my light on to see if that'll make it a little bit easier too. Boy, I sounded like a drama queen, and I just threaded that very, very easily, didn't I? That was kind of cool. Sometimes I'll battle that quite a bit. I don't know if the rest of you, as you've gotten older, if it's become more difficult to thread needles, but it certainly is the case for me. Okay, so we got the featherweight re-threaded already. I'm going to shut the light off again. It's got a beautiful LED light, but when you're shooting it with a camera, it makes it kind of difficult to see things. So I'm going to shut the light off and we're going to sew without the light. All right. And we might break this thread again. It's only rated, according to the spool, it's only rated at 30 weight, which is pretty doggone light. So let me ask you guys for your input on something. I'm going to use this in lieu of quilt batting. It's kind of a stiffener with 100% cotton, which we're going to be sewing. But I want you guys to pick out the color that we're going to use. We could either go with red. We could go with this kind of a mauve pink color, whatever that is. Or we can go with uh, what I would call kind of an Easter, an Easter purple. So we've got purple. Whatever this is, is kind of a mauve peach color, whatever you'd call it. And then we've got the red. 
which color 100% cotton would you like me to try to stitch off? And we can try stitching off with no stiffener, which raises the challenge even higher. And then I'll stitch it as well with a stiffener. So which color should we go with? Red, this one in the middle, or the purple one? I'm saying this one in the middle because the color is a little bit tricky as far as what you call it. RJS7 is saying, go purple, go purple. So let's go purple. I'm going to throw these other to the side. We might go back to those again. We might go back to those again. And I'm going to go with just two layers of this cotton. We'll try stitching it, first of all, without stiffener, which, you know, that, that tension has to be just absolutely bang on. Otherwise, we're not going to get that knot, or, knot centered with material as thin as this. There's just no way. Sometimes if you're sewing something so thin, depending on the, how heavy that thread is, you really, no matter how perfect you get that, that uh, tension, you're not able to get that knot, knot centered in between the two layers because it's just, it's so thin. It's like sewing rice paper. Hopefully we can get pretty close. Okay, let's give this a go. And I'm going to leave the music off for a little bit so we can actually listen to the machine running. And I did have to replace, sadly, 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 sadly. And I, I really emphasize sadly because I love to go with original everything when I'm doing a restore on a machine. I love to go with original everything. The bobbin case that was in this featherweight when it came to the workshop was original. It was an original one that Singer would have put in the machine. But there was a fatal flaw where it was stripped out on the bobbin case to adjust the tension. It was slipping, and so you couldn't get an even tension on it. So I had to go with an aftermarket one because I didn't have an, 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 an original Singer bobbin in the workshop. But some of the aftermarket ones do a real good job. Other ones do not. The one that I'm going to be using in this machine, I think, does a decent job. It really does. Okay, so let me grab a couple of clips because I am going to clip this when I sew it. I'll use the clips off of uh, Paula's stitch-off holder that she made for me at Christmas time. And if you haven't seen this before in one of the other premieres, I think it's super cool. I get, I get gifts all the time because folks are just incredibly kind and very, very generous. And uh, I was using a stitch off holder like this. And you'll notice my one little cover is missing. And it's because I'm using it up by the thread to make this tall spool a little bit more stable. This actually came off of this right here. It's called, you know, MacGyvering it or being a little bit adaptive. And uh, Paula, when she sent me a goodie box at Christmas time, said, there's nothing wrong with this Scrabble style one that you modified that was sent to you. And you add these little metal, you know, wires that kind of give you the extra stability. But this adds just a little bit more vintage class, doesn't it? And so I try to use this whenever I remember to use it. It's got all these cool people on it, all these little different sayings that Paula kind of built into the matrix of things. So all of that blah, blah, blahing is, and actually, you know what I just realized? The only downfall of the clips that Paula gave me, they're wonderful, they're compact and all of that, but they have no, they have no cushion between the metal and the bed of the featherweight that I just got done restoring, giving it this beautiful, lustry finish that you can see, hopefully. And I don't want to scratch this during this live stream and give Julie a heart attack. So I will not be able to use the ones that Paula sent to me. I'm going to use mine that are incredibly expensive, incredibly, ridiculously expensive. Let me show these to you. You guys are already laughing because you know that I'm very thrifty. You know that I'm very, very thrifty. And these came from... The Dollar Tree. Oh, I can't use this one. I've got to use a different one or I have to put that rubber side down. But these do have a little bit of a cover on them 
to create a buffer between the finish of the machine and uh, the clip itself. They're grossly oversized, aren't they, compared to these? These are a lot nicer from a size standpoint, but the all-metal factor is a no-go on this featherweight. So I'll use these. I'll grab a different one that has covers on both sides. Let's see here. There we go. All right, now I have two good ones. So I'm going to put this back up there. I'll move this to the back. Oops, I almost knocked our people off. Sorry about that, guys. Move this to the back, and we'll use it for display purposes. And I'll put these oversized clips on here as we're going to be stitching off these two layers of cotton with no stiffener. It's a little tricky, a little bit of a tricky sew-off. We'll kind of put those on there. Put this right about there. There we go. And hopefully I'm not going that rubber, that little rubber coating is creating enough of a buffer that I'm not going to scratch the bed. The good thing about my process, though, when I re-clear coat a machine like this and I condition the surface is I've got multiple layers of clear coat on here. So if Julie ever has a grandchild or someone come by and they somehow scratch her featherweight, you can rebuff that down to the next layer of clear coat and get that scratch out of here without a lot of difficulty. You just have to use a compound, a safe compound to buff it out. What I usually use to do it is I use, um, you can use one of two things. You can use something that, let me show you. If you scratch your featherweight and you have a heart attack and you're going to a quilting retreat and you're like, I can't go to a quilting retreat with a scratched featherweight. It's not going to work. No. You can use something like this. This will sometimes do the job. <clears throat> it's by Turtle Wax. Turtle Wax has been involved with polishing type compounds for a really long time. And this particular one is designed... <clears throat> To give you a clean finish uh, and also as a buffing compound to take out minor to moderate size scratches. I think that's what it says. So this is something you can use uh, on a painted surface to try to get a minor scratch out of the finish. And again, you want to use in conjunction with this probably a microfiber cloth similar, similar to this. These also come from the Dollar Tree, by the way. You get two for a dollar twenty-five now, so it's no longer the Dollar Tree. It's kind of like the dollar twenty-five tree, and I know they're located all over the U.S., so you guys know what I'm talking about. So a microfiber cloth, I would put a little bit of water on it, and then add a little dab of this uh, buffing compound by Turtle Wax, and just really, really gentle touch, circular going both ways and just work that scratch out of the finish. And you go a little bit wider than the scratch so that that is going to blend in. Kind of like I tried to do, I showed you at the beginning of this live stream, what I tried to do in matching and blending in uh, that uh, fabric safe paint that I used to clean up uh, Julie's case. If you didn't see that, you can rewind after the live stream and look at kind of what I tried to do to improve the look of that case for her. But in lieu of a compound like this by Turtle Wax, you can also use a microfiber cloth like this with a little bit, and this is going to shock you, but it's true, a little bit of white toothpaste will also work. Not quite as well as probably a professional compound like that, but you dampen the uh, microfiber cloth, put just a little dab of toothpaste on there, and you can also sometimes work out the most basic of scratches on a clear coat, assuming that they're not too deep. The last result, and it's I, I give it the last result not because it's the worst result, it's the best result actually, but the other thing you can do to clean up a scratch on a clear coat surface is you can use two to 3,000 uh, grit um, sandpaper it's basically an auto grade sandpaper let me show it to you hopefully i don't knock all the stuff off the shelf and getting it out and it, it used to be that 2000 grit sandpaper for working on cars to get scratches out of out of uh, clear coat 
this was like the ultimate 2000 grit, right? Now they have, I think, I think one of my, my friend, you guys know, Jose, when we did the Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory fundraiser for the local humane society and his little boy picked out the final golden ticket that belonged to uh, Veronica and Emily uh, Oyama from Texas. They became the grand prize winners, kind of like Charlie did in the movie when he got the chocolate factory. That was the big deal. Well, Jose's son is the one that picked the ticket and Jose does detailing work on cars. He is incredibly gifted in that area. And when I told him about the 2000 grit sandpaper, he goes, oh, that's old now. Now they have 5,000, maybe even 6,000 grit sandpaper. So I got to get, I got to get caught up. But you take some 2000 grit sandpaper like this with a little bit of uh, a mild, a mild dish soap, just a little bit of a mild dish soap on that scratch, just a little dab of it. And you massage that in with this 2000 grit sandpaper. You got to do it very, very carefully and very gently. Uh, otherwise, you can go through all of those layers of clear coat in a hiccup. But that's also a method that I'll use sometimes if the scratch is a little bit deeper and I want to try to work that scratch out. But it takes a lot of patience, a lot of skill. Otherwise, you can burn through those layers of clear coat real quick and then you're down to bare paint and you're in a world of hurt. So, you know, try the least invasive first and then you could always graduate up to using an auto advanced type, you know, two to five thousand grit sandpaper to try to get that scratch out. Hopefully that's helpful. I like covering that stuff because inevitably, if you own a featherweight, it's a showpiece for you. It's kind of the gold standard at quilting retreats and quilting expos. And uh, when you get a scratch on it, it can just, it can make your heart sink, can it? So hopefully some of those tips prove to be a little bit helpful for you. All right, I'll move all this stuff to the side. And it looks like, um, yeah, I agree. I agree, Mindy. That is kind of a peachy color, isn't it? That's kind of a peachy color. And uh, Emma is busily working on trying to translate and share the conversation she's having with Christina from Brazil. If you're brand new to this live chat, you've never been in a live chat on Cow Country before, we have international folks pop in all the time. Some of them will set up their keyboard so they can type and communicate with us in English. Others don't. And that's okay because we have Google Translate. Thank goodness. And that's kind of what Emma is doing right now is she is taking the Portuguese, the Portuguese, which is the language used commonly in Brazil, and she's translating it to English, reading what uh, Christina wrote, and then sending a message back to her and also telling us when she can, what are these gals talking about? What, what are they discussing? So that's kind of fun. But we have folks from Finland. We have folks from uh, earlier in the uh, the earlier live stream today when we were doing the unboxing. We had somebody from Norway. We have folks from Germany. We have folks from all around the world. It's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Let's actually sew with this little featherweight now and see how it does showing these two very thin layers of 100% cotton, kind of this Easter purple. And uh, I think I have the presser foot pressure adjusted well for the cotton, but we'll see. Again, if you're if you're sewing with any sewing machine, any sewing machine, it can be a brand new fourteen thousand dollar long arm quilter, and you set the stitch length to a desired stitch length, and you're not getting the fullness of that setting. Let's say you have it set on six or seven, and you're getting like eight or nine. That's generally going to be a product of presser foot pressure. And what you'll have to do, depending on what kind of material you're sewing, you'll have to increase that pressure foot pressure. Or if you're sewing something really super delicate like this, like this 100% cotton, and you're starting to stitch across and you're getting bunching. You know what I mean by bunching? The material is kind of, that's my best description of it. Then you've got too much pressure foot pressure and you need to turn that pressure foot knob on top counterclockwise so you have less pressure down on that delicate material. Happens a lot with cottons, happens with silk, happens with satin, and a lot of those other tricky lightweight materials. So we'll see. We'll see how I have it have adjusted. Take it nice and slow and listen to this machine. Matter of fact, let me shut off the heater as well. Temperatures are dropping in Wisconsin tonight. Uh, and again, tomorrow it's only going to be in the 30s. So I'm not going to leave the heater off for very long. All right, here we go. 
Listen to this machine run. Oh, I got to do one other thing. One other thing. See what it is? Our take-up arm is not at the highest position right now, which means we're not going to get the ideal launch. There we go. See how it's on down sweep now? All right. Now we're ready. Now we're sort of ready. If I don't knock the camera over. We're almost ready, sort of. All right. Here we go. Two layers of 100% cotton. Again, our setup is we're using a Schmetz embroidery needle size 7511. We're using this Aerofill fancy dancy 100% cotton thread from Italy because that's what Julie wants to use. So let's give us a try. Hopefully this time we don't break the thread because we're sewing something super lightweight. Here we go. Now see, I'm getting a little bit, you know, that, that's maybe that's just the product of the clip. I was going to say I was getting a little bit of bunching. Yeah, we're getting, I think we're getting good feed. I think we're getting good feed. The clip kind of caught a little bit, and that's why it was, it looked like it was starting to bunch. Let me take these clips off so I don't drag them across the bed. And we'll evaluate using this semi-tricky Aerofill 100% cotton thread. It's only rated at 30 weight, so it's actually lighter than some of the real cheap uh, Coates & Clark multi-purpose threads that you've seen me use before on some of the machines. The stuff, this 100% cotton thread, it makes me a little bit nervous because it's really prone. It's very, very delicate and fragile. Uh, and uh, like I said, when I was setting this machine up, getting ready for this live stream, it broke multiple times when I was trying to sew different uh, sew-offs with it. So the top stitch looks pretty doggone good, but the bottom lock stitch is more pronounced. So what we have to do maybe is look at backing off our upper tension just a little bit. The top stitch is not bad, but it's a contrast to that lock stitch on the bottom. I'll kind of show it to you. Let me see if I can back the camera up a little bit and see the screen as well. I gotta angle this screen. Give you a guy, give you guys an idea of my setup. I'm kind of trying this setup. I'm trying this setup here. So I got this rack, right? Let me turn Julie's stuff down, her information down. I'll just move it. I got this rack here. Okay. Multiple layers. It's kind of good. I can put my mint cookies right here since I haven't had, I really didn't have much in the way of lunch or dinner today with the live stream earlier and all that. So I got my little mint cookies. I can sneak one of those. And then here, if I'm shooting towards the uh, workbench, I can set the camera on this level. And then I've got the laptop up here where you guys can see the live chat and all that. So it works pretty well, but I've got to angle the screen, right? So that when I'm sitting on the chair in front of the featherweight, I can see what's happening on the screen and how I have the camera angled. Do you know what I mean? So it's a little bit, the first time I used it was on the live stream earlier today. And it seems to work pretty well, but you got to, you got to kind of get, yeah. You got to kind of get used to it a little bit. You know what I mean? You got to kind of get used to it. So, but I love seeing all the folks popping into the chat. We've got Emma and Mindy and we've got Christina and RJ. Is that RJ7? I think it is. RJS7. So uh, I love when people feel comfortable enough. They realize that this is a friendly place and that we're not looking to be hypercritical of anyone for any reason. And eventually they migrate from the shadows into the live chat, which is really cool. So anyway, this is my setup. You can kind of see it. And it's perfect time right now to grab one of these mint cookies. These are really good. I'm going to give a shameless plug right now to the Dollar Tree. Again, I've mentioned them several times already. And I get a box, two sleeves of these mint cookies. They're not overly minty. They're just a really light, delicate mint flavor. And I can eat a whole roll of these suckers. And they're really good to bridge me between meals if I miss a meal, which I do often. So at any rate, if you have a Dollar Tree near you or a Dollar twenty-five tree now, look for these. They're a, a baked mint cookie in the cookie section. I don't remember what the brand name is. I think I had sent a picture of this to Emma. So Emma might remember what the maker is. But just look for the baked mint cookies. Oh, my gosh, they're good. Here we go. <gasps> yep. They're really, really good. but. Don't try talking immediately after popping one in your mouth. 
it doesn't work too well. Yeah. All right, let's look at these stitches. Let's take a look at these stitches now and see what we think. So again, we have two real thin layers, 100% cotton. A little bit hard to see the stitching for me, but maybe you can see it better on the camera. Once the camera decides to focus, that is. Ah, there we go. So that's our top stitch that I think could be a little bit better defined. It's not bad. And if you look at a stitch from the side, you can oftentimes make out the clarity of the definition of that stitch even better. So I like to turn the material sometimes on the side too and look at it from that angle. Matter of fact, I'll set it on the bed of the featherweight and we'll kind of look at it that way. So you can see the, the, that top stitch that way also, which I think gives you even a better view sometimes. Well, maybe not. Let me put it on, let me put it on uh, Paula's display thing. That might be better yet. Although this stuff is so delicate, with just two real thin layers of cotton, it's not gonna, it's not gonna lay there very well, and I can't even clip it. That's why having that stiffener in there helps quite a bit. All right, I'm gonna try to hold it in place and give you guys a better look at that. Let me turn it towards this way. Eventually, I'll get it. Eventually. Okay, now we finally have it. Now, there you can see a lot better that the top stitch is a decent-looking top stitch. The spacing, the formation of the stitching, the integrity of the stitch is really quite good considering we're sewing two thin layers of cotton with no stiffener. We're just kind of zipping through it. And there's a lot that can go wrong when you don't have that fabric with some degree of stability, which when you're sewing two layers of cotton like this, you don't have a huge amount of stability in that in that fabric. I'll kind of go across it here. We can kind of look at them across. And again, it's not even right now. It's kind of tilted forward. So I'll kind of push it back a little bit. On this end, you can see it a little bit more clearly. We've got some very good clarity of stitching. And again, when you turn it on the side, Depending on the, the material, this purple might be a little bit tricky. But when you turn it on the side, you sometimes can see that stitch definition uh, with even greater clarity. Maybe not in this instance. A little bit on that end, you can kind of see it there. We turn it over. We'll take a look at that lock stitch now, which I'll put on this little display thing again. I'll try to. That lock stitch really has quite a bit of poppiness to it. And again, the simple rule when you're trying to balance tension, tension is something that I get questions about all the time from folks, even experienced seamstresses. Let me kind of bring that camera out this way again. Okay. <clears throat> even experienced seamstresses will struggle with tension sometimes if they're changing the type of needle they're using, if they're changing thread types or if they're working with a material that's unfamiliar to them. Hold on a second. We're almost there. This, this camera will be nice to us. Ah. Okay, now it's time to zero in. Come on, zero in. Oh my gosh. You see that? It's so light, it won't even stand on here. Ugh. All right, I'm just gonna try to hold it. Or maybe I can lean it against her somehow. Oh my gosh, I took out the whole assembly. The whole thing went out. Anti-M, anti-M. Okay, let's try this again. Got, got to remember which side is which now. Okay, we're gonna try it like this. We're gonna give it a try like this and see if that camera will be happier for us.
See that? It, it just had to see the girl's shoes. See the girl's shoes at the top of the screen? Once it saw the shoes, it was like, okay, we'll focus on the shoes. So here you can see the, the lock stitch is quite a bit more poppy than the top stitch. And again, the, the angle we have right now is not ideal. It's not ideal at all. I'm just going to stop right there because that's that's level. It's level leaning against this display thing. And you can see the clarity of the stitching much more clearly here on that lock stitch portion. There we go. Looking up at the laptop now. So what I'm seeing, though, is that that lock stitch is a little bit over poppy when you compare it to the top stitch. This is why I usually use stiffener straight away, because when you're doing this, trying to do this on camera with one hand, it don't work out so great sometimes. Okay, so there's our top stitch. So my only point is, if we wanted to make this top stitch, it's not a bad top stitch at all. But if we wanted to make this a little bit more poppy than it is right now, we want to give a little bit more poppiness. What we would do is we would back off this upper tension just slightly. And I've got it dialed back quite a ways right now because when you're running with a lighter thread like this, it is a little bit on the fragile side. It has to work its way off the top of the spool pin, down through the tension discs, around that take-up spring, around this little thread guide here, behind this thread guide. Actually, that thread is not in the right position right now. This is a great opportunity to show you what happens Sometimes when you're in a little bit of a rush, we had that thread break, right? When we were sewing that saddle grade leather, this thread right here that goes up to that take up arm should actually be behind this thread guide and it's in front of it right now. So I've got to correct that right now and I'm doing it with one hand. So this is a coordination test. There we go. Tighten that up a little bit. So if you're using your th your uh, feather weight and you're a little bit in a rush, you'll sometimes forget to move that thread that goes up to the take-up arm behind this thread guide. Both threads, the one coming from the top down through the discs and the thread coming from the take-up spring going towards the take-up arm, that thread needs to be behind that thread guide. And you're not seeing a thing that I'm talking about right now. Hold on a second. Okay, finally, let me set the camera down. So the thing that I was showing you a second ago, but you couldn't see it because I had the camera pointed in the wrong direction, is very commonly folks will allow this thread, or when they thread it, this thread here that's coming through the take-up spring, they'll allow it to go from here straight up to the take-up arm, kind of like it was before. I'll show you again. They'll allow this thread right here to be in front of this thread guy like that. That can also impact your stitch quality because this thread guide is designed to allow the locomotion of that thread between here and that take up arm to be more even. And when you've got it in front like this, coming through the take-up spring, you're not getting that stability as you do when it's behind this thread guide right here. So that's why we need to move this to the appropriate place. It's a little bit easier with a dental tool, but a little scary too, behind that thread guide. And I see a lot of pictures even on the internet where people are showing their machines and that thread is in front of this thread guide. But if you look in the owner's manual, it'll show you clearly that it should be behind there. So all of that blah, blah, blah. Then that may have been part of our problem, it's hard to say. But all in all, for sewing two layers of real thin cotton like this, with no stiffener, no quilt batting in between as we typically would have it, we're getting some really good, good looking stitching all in all. Kind of move that across a little bit.
But again, I would back off that upper tension a little bit if we were going to be sewing this all day long. But we're not going to be sewing this all day long. We're going to sew another piece of this now. And we're going to put a stiffener in between. And you'll see that it will give us an even better clarity of stitch. Even though we're getting some decent stitch quality, that little bit of stiffener in there is going to help us out quite a bit. So I'm going to cut a strip of this stiffener. And we're going to wrap some 100% cotton around it. And we can stick with the purple since we're coming up on Easter. Or we could go to red. What do you guys think? Should we do purple again? Should we do the peachy color as uh, Mindy referred to it? Or should we go with purple again? Purple, red, or peach? What do you guys think? <clears throat> I'll kind of show those to you again. Peach, red, or purple? Which color do you guys think? Emma's saying, let's try the peach. Let's go peachy. And I think trying the peachy is peachy. So put a little bit of music while we're getting peachy-ish. <clears throat> Get a little drink. And now let's sew 100% cotton again. But we're going to put a stiffener in there to give a little bit more stability. And some people only use... Got to turn this down. That music is very excited. Um, some people only use a stiffener on machines that have uh, ornamental or decorative stitching capabilities. Uh, and I think they really do a disservice. That's why um, when, uh, when Paula, that made, also made this really cool stitch-off display thing that you've already seen, this thing back here. When Paula made that, she also sent... Uh, some of this Kona cotton for me as well. And uh, in between each layer of this Kona cotton is a layer of quilt batting that gives a little bit more uh, stability to that very delicate cotton, especially the Kona stuff, I think is even a little bit more delicate. So uh, we're going to use a stiffener just to, I think, enhance that stitching a little bit more so we don't do a disservice to this featherweight because the featherweight is doing an excellent job uh, of managing even with that fragile thread up top, we still got all the way down that stitch line for the saddle grade leather. But it finally broke at the end, didn't it? It's okay. Gave us a chance to thread the machine again. Although we discovered that I didn't thread it 100% correct because I had that thread by the upper tension in front of that thread guide instead of behind it, which is a common mistake. And maybe I did it subconsciously just so I could use it as a teaching point, huh? You guys buy that? Uh, no, don't buy it. I, I overlooked it. I overlooked it. It's okay. Okay, so I'm going to slide a little bit of this. I'm going to see how wide this is so I can gauge how much of this I'm going to need. And this white stuff that I'm using as a stiffener it's a type of compressed felt, but I've used it for so many different applications over the years. I've used it uh, and recently used it to send to a lady that had accidentally torn out the lubrication pads from her Swedish beauty that are in the free arm area. And she was just panicking that she had irreparably damaged her, her uh, Swedish beauty. I said, that's not a problem. I've got this cool white stuff. It's a type of compressed felt. You know, it's malleable enough. You can cut it to the shape that you need it and then put it back into that free arm area. It's wonderfully absorbent. I showed this to you guys recently on a live stream or premiere, but I've used this stuff for so many things. So many things. Wonderful stuff. And I've got a huge roll of it. I don't even remember where I got it. Long time ago, I got it. Okay, so now we're sliding this peach colored 100% cotton with this cool stiffener inside of it and you can see the what's happening to that thread in the back see the curly q stuff going on that's a product of the thread but it's also a product of my sewing environment right now being a little bit on the dry side i'm running a, a dehumidifier because of all the rain we've been getting and periodically what i try to remember to do is i take a squirt bottle like this 
and I squirt the carpeting underneath where I'm sitting. And it helps a lot as far as the static factor with thread. So you can try that in your sewing environment as well. Just don't spray too close to your foot controller or anything else that's electrified. <laughs> or you might get a nice surprise. You know what I mean? So uh, you squirt a little bit on the ground. It helps quite a bit. And then once we get into the summer of things and the environment coming out of winter isn't quite as dry, it becomes a lot easier uh, to work with threads that are more prone uh, to picking up that static factor all right i'm just gonna play a little bit of music in the background so it's so doggone quiet down here okay so we're going to try this peach material now 100 percent cotton we've added a stiffener to it now i've got the machine threaded correctly now with that uh thread behind that thread guide near the upper tension so we'll stitch down again with this 100% cotton, and I'll probably, yeah, why don't I do it? I'll probably throw these clips on just to make sure that we get a, a nice stitch launch on this material. There we go. And we'll leave the light off. Again, you know, with the light, it kind of messes with the camera. With the, light, uh, with the light on, it messes with the camera. With the light off, you're able to see what's happening down at the needle a lot more clearly. I'll even get a little bit closer. So you can kind of see those stitches being laid down. Oh, okay. Um, R RJS7 had a question, but apparently I answered it. So that's good. So yeah, I mean, we're working with... Uh, so many things can affect the stitch uh, quality, right? So many things can affect stitch quality. Um, sometimes it's it's needle compatibility to the thread. Sometimes it's presser foot pressure. Sometimes it's technique. I had one customer recently that had an awful technique when it came to believing in her heart of hearts that the feed dogs were evil and that they would not do the job. So she was doing a lot of pulling and a lot of pushing and breaking a lot of needles and scarring her, thro uh, her throat plate up on the machine. And you guys remember me talking about that 2000 grit sandpaper that you can use as a last resort to try to get a scratch out of the finish. If you ever it, uh, acquire a machine or you get a machine that has that, that scarring on the throat plate and as that thread is coming up from the bobbin case, it's catchy on there and it can create a lot of problems. You can also use a real thin piece of that 2000 grit sandpaper to sand that throat plate opening as well to get that, that scarring gone so that that thread will feed very, very nicely and very evenly coming out of that bobbin case. Just another suggestion or a tip. Uh, you know, it's a common occurrence. It's a common occurrence for folks to have that happen. All right. I know we're still in a semi-COVID environment, but I, I put a little bit of good old spit on that thread, and hopefully that's going to keep it a little bit more stable. <laughs> I shouldn't have told you that. I should not have told you that, but I did, being honest. Okay, so let's try this peachy material. Now we've got a stiffener. We're still sewing with the same stitch length. And if you don't know anything at all about a featherweight, maybe I shouldn't assume that you do know. This is obviously our stitch length controller over here. The featherweight, when it's all the way at the lowest position, and this was part of the problem with this machine because of an issue with the pitman arm on the inside. Um, that's been resolved now. So when it's at the lowest position, you should be getting somewhere around six to seven stitches per inch. As you move it up, you can go all the way down to 30 stitches per inch, which is teeny tiny. We can try that. Uh, and then as you move it all the way to the top, you're sewing in reverse on the featherweight. So... Those are the basics of the machine, light on, light off. When you're winding a bobbin, I'm not going to do it in this live stream, but I'll describe it to you. You're going to be putting your spool pin up here with your thread, whatever you're on. You're going to be putting your thread on the spool pin is what I meant to say. Blah, blah, blah. And then you're going to be bringing it from here to that same thread guide right over here. Just like when we're threading it. 
just like when we're threading the machine. But here's where you take a, 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 a turn. You go from here all the way across the front of the machine to this thread guide down here, this thread tensioner, I should say. And then from this thread tensioner, after coming across the front of the machine, you then come up to your mounting point where you're going to put your bobbin right here. And this is this is a flange design right here. If you look at the side of it, I don't know if the camera is going to focus on that or not. But Singer made pin style ones where you would slide the bobbin in. It would have uh, a, a place where that pin that was mounted on here could go into that bobbin and then hold it in place. This one is flanged, which means it flares out and it creates a natural tension on that bobbin so that it doesn't slip when you're winding it. That's what it's designed to do. I'm a little bit too low. Sorry about that. So this has a flange design. You can kind of see that opening on the end. And if you ever have a featherweight or another style bobbin winder like this that has that flange design and your bobbin is slipping all the time and it's really, really frustrating, you can very, very gently go in there. I'm not actually going to do it, but you can actually very gently go in there with a screwdriver and just hold it stable and give it a gentle little twist like this to open up that flange to create that natural tension again that'll hold your bobbin nice and firm. And when you're winding it, it's not going to allow it to slip. But just don't, don't flex that too far because it's a very light gauge metal all in all. And uh, you could crack that off. So just go in there with a, an appropriate sized screwdriver Give it that gentle little turn to kind of expand that just slightly. And then that bobbin will slide on. You'll, when you slide the bobbin back on, you'll be able to feel straight away how firm that bobbin is mounting onto that stem with that natural tension. And never another quick little tip. I'm kind of, I, know, I, I know I'm kind of bouncing around, but these are valuable bounce arounds. Notice as well that there's an oiling point on here. So many people miss that oiling point on this bobbin winder. And when that sucker is turning like that and winding a bobbin, it's creating a lot of friction, right? Creating viscosity inside of there for that extension. And periodically about, probably about every 20 hours of sewing, if you're winding a lot of bobbins, if you're not, you know, longer than that, just put a single little drop of oil in there and then turn it a couple of times so that it's spinning nicely like this one is. So again, winding a bobbin, come from the top to this thread guide, across the front of the machine, down to this tensioner, up here to there, rotate this in, disengage your clutch, and wind your bobbin. And uh, again, if you get a, if as you're winding the bobbin and, and the, you know, the, the, the thread is going back and forth across that bobbin, if it's concentrating on the left side, then you need to loosen this screw right down here. If it's concentrating on the left side, loosen the screw and slide this tensioner a little bit to the right. If the thread is concentrating on the bobbin as it's winding, if it's heavier on the right, then you need to loosen this screw and try to slide this tensioner a little bit to the left to find that sweet spot where that thread is going evenly back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Because you don't want to have a bobbin wound unevenly. It sounds like a real basic thing, but folks will really struggle sometimes. And it's because they're not winding their bobbins well. So just a, a tip for whatever that's worth. All right. Blah, 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 blah. But hopefully that's helpful. All right. So we're going to show some of this cool peachy material, as uh, Mindy referred to it. Mindy also, uh, I got to I gotta give her an honorable mention. She submitted a beautiful, beautiful writing piece for our recent contest giveaway when we hit 12,000 subscribers. And I had a chance to read that a couple of times on the live stream. I also posted it on Facebook if you want to check it out. Check out all the other ones as well. Some beautiful, talented people writing. All right. And now I'll be less, I'll be more talented and less talkative and we'll finally sew this peachy material finally ah, <laughs> all right here we go after i blow off my glasses 
All right, so our take-up arm is good to go. We're going to start to go across this material now. Here we go. All right. Take my little clips off so I don't scratch anything, hopefully. Kind of rock this a little bit. I kind of sewed a little bit too far. I almost ended up creating a little bit of a jam there. And if anyone wants to um, get a sample of this compressed felt stiffener stuff that I use, um, let me know. I'll be happy to send you a sample of it, and you can kind of you can kind of check it out and uh, decide you know how you're going to use it. You know, I'll send you a good little chunk of it, and that way you can try it maybe as you're sewing 100% cotton material like this and see see how it helps you as far as that stitch quality. Okay, so let me get our stitch off holder because now we actually have a little bit of stability with that stiffener in there. And hopefully we can get the right angle to see these stitches because I can tell you, looking at them right now, these are some gorgeous stitches and we've got a real nice balance between that top stitch and that lock stitch. All right, let me get this into position, grab that camera and see if our camera will be nice to us. And we can zero in on these stitches and take a look at them. And it'll show you, it'll show you by using uh, some type of stiffener when you're working with lighter materials, whether it's the tearaway type or the stuff that you, dissolves or whatever it is, it's going to help you a lot in getting clarity of stitching. It's going to help you a lot. Let me turn my light on see if that helps. No, it doesn't. I don't like that. Try to move this forward a little bit. The angle is what's hurting us a little bit on this because we've got a little bit of a quilting effect on there and it's tilted back a little bit. Let me lean this a little bit more. We'll take a look at those stitches again. I'm going to push my luck here and see if I can get closer. Folks, that is some really good-looking stitching. Some very, very good-looking stitching. And I think our presser foot pressure is in the right spot because we got, we got some nice, even feed for the stitching. This is kind of tucked down a little bit, isn't it? I'm kind of pulling that up a little bit if I can. We got nice even feed. We didn't get any puckering. And our stitch length is comparable to what our stitch setting is. It's not compressed. I'm kind of looking over my shoulder as I'm doing this. So if it's a little bit wobbly or whatever, you know, that's a product of trying to keep it balanced. I'm going to hold it as well and see if I can show you guys, because these are really lovely, lovely stitches. I'm going to kind of pull it back a little bit too, because we have a little bit of a quilting effect and it kind of tucks that stitch in a little bit. Let's see if I can show this to you again. Now let me try it like this. It's not cooperating. This is a much better camera than my other one, but it still struggles. It's not designed to probably get up this close to something. And so it struggles sometimes with trying to trying to autofocus as I'm going across something like this. Let 
trout like that. If I cut my hand over there, I don't know what. I'm battling this thing. I'm sorry about that. But but you can see um, when it does focus, if it focuses. We're getting, we're getting a real good balance on that top stitch. And that's always a concern when you're trying to uh, get that stitch balance just right. I'm just going to try to zoom in on a little bit more. And then I'm going to give up and turn it over to the lock stitch. There we go. That's a little bit better. All right, you guys get the idea. I'm going to drive you nuts if we don't move on. So let me turn this around now. That's our top stitch. Now we're going to look at that lock stitch. And again, I'm looking at that. If I were sewing a ton of this stuff, I probably would look at adjusting that upper tension back or bumping up our bobbin tension a little bit. Let's take a look at this one again. Here, let me bring this over here. Bring this right there. There we go. Bring this forward. So again, this is going to be our lock stitch we're looking at now, or try to look at anyway. Very good looking page 34 lock stitch but it's almost on the edge of being a little bit too poppy. And while the top stitch looks really good, if I were sewing a ton of this with this stiffener that we have in it right now, I would look at probably backing off that upper tension just slightly, just slightly back off that upper tension to give a little bit more to that top stitch. Okay, so we've got some really good looking stitching. Now let's push this machine a little bit further and see if we can go into that stitch length and bring it down quite a ways. We'll see how this thread manages that because when you're going shorter like that, it's going to put a little bit more stress on that thread as we're almost overlaying it. So I'm going to try that. Get that presser foot in place. There we go. And now we're going to take that stitch length adjuster and bring it down to probably about 15 to 20 stitches per inch. And I'm keeping an eye on our time because we're running a little bit longer than I thought we would be running. And I, I want to be sensitive to that because I know that our East Coast folks or our folks in Brazil, it's even later there. So... Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I showed you how to adjust the stitch length. We're going to take it now to right around close to 15 stitches per inch, right about there, I think. So let's give that a go now. We'll see how this material manages with a much shortened stitch. All right, let me get my take-up arm set up properly. There we go. Run that down sweep. Get this into place. Get that adjusted so you can see that. All right, here we go. Here's our next stitch line on this 100% cotton, this peach colored cotton with, uh, again, that Aerofill thread. It's about 30 weight from Italy. And we're using a size uh, 7511 embroidery needle. That's our setup today. All right, let's give this a go, see how we do. Let me shut off the heater so you can listen to this machine run. Complete quiet in the workshop, here we go. I 
I love the sound of a featherweight uh, with the hook system that it has and the bobbin uh, case, how it interacts uh, in that space. It's got this delicate little hum, doesn't it? It's got such a pretty little sound to it when it's running, when they're running well, I should say. All right, there we go. I got my thread at the right length. I always give it a tail of probably a good four or five inches. There we go. Oh, that's a pretty stitch. Oh, my goodness. And co in comparison to our full-size stitch that we did, that's around six or seven stitches per inch. Uh, what a neat contrast it is to look at these. I'm going to see if I can hopefully get this to cooperate, and we'll set it up on our stitch display so we can look at them side by side. I'm actually going to use my other stitch display because I can bend um that wire and make it lean back a little bit more which we might need with this i think we do i think it'll be better all right let's take a look at these this is our top stitch we just laid it down the top row again is the one we did first six to seven stitches per inch and then the bottom row we're right around 15 stitches per inch so we we about tripled our number of stitches uh in that space Oh, there we go. Now I finally have it in the right. I had to look over my shoulder. Beautiful, beautiful stitching. I'm actually going to move it a little bit closer. I'm going to really be a rebel here and see if this camera can adjust. That might be pushing it a little bit too far. I like that peachy color too with that white thread, don't you? That seems to work nicely. Seems to work real nice. So I'm seeing a uh, I'm seeing a good stitch balance. If you're looking at stitches like this, and it looks like <clears throat> the thread is a little bit too tight as it's pulling down, that's generally going to be an evidence that your upper tension is not high enough. The bobbin case is pulling down so hard that it's compressing your top stitch. I don't see that here, either with the top row where we have about uh, five or six excuse me, six or seven stitches per inch, or the bottom row where we have about 15 stitches per inch. The, the stitch presentation, the integrity of the stitch seems to be really, really nicely balanced right now. And that's also a product that our presser foot pressure is allowing that stitch feed to be spot on. We're getting the fullness of that stitch. See what happens when I turn the light on? You get this little waving thing. Kind of weird. I'll shut that off again. So I'm really happy with the stitch quality that we're getting right now, using, especially using a stiffener. It really takes it up a notch. What does our lock stitch look like? Let's turn it over and take a look at that. I'm guessing it's still going to be a little bit on the poppy side. Take a look and see what you guys think. Right there in particular, um, I'm just seeing, a, you know, top row, bottom row. I'm seeing a beautiful, beautiful page 34 lock stitch. It's not overly compressed where that upper tension is pulling up too heavily. We've got a good balance on presser foot pressure. We're getting a, a good response as far as how the machine is interacting with this embroidery needle and this uh, auto fill or whatever it is, this Italian embroidery quilting thread this is a difficult setup to get right and it took a little bit of hit and miss 
but it was really one of the demands of uh, Julie. She said, I need it to be set up so I don't need to battle. I don't need to battle that, uh, that stitch balance using this type of thread. And this 100% cotton that we're using right now, this peachy cotton combined with this stiffener is going to be very comparable to the layers of quilting with that quilt batting that Julie's going to be using. So I think I've got the machine set up for success, which is always my goal. I try to set the machine up so it's going to serve the customer and give them the least amount of frustration. This camera is going to give me a little bit of frustration. Oh. <laughs> yes, it is. You need me a little bit of frustration, but that's okay. We'll figure it out. See that I had to take it off of the stitch display thing to get it to work well. So again, a beautiful lock stitch. If I don't drop the camera, a beautiful lock stitch, a beautiful top stitch uh, as well. I feel very confident that we have that the setup on this machine right for what Julie's going to be using it for. Now, if we all of a sudden changed from 100% cotton thread, this Italian, uh, did I get it right? Autofill, Aerofill, something like that. I'll show you guys on camera again if you want to try this stuff out. It looks like Aerofill. Let me get right next to the camera. You can kind of see what we're using for thread. There it is. Made in Italy, 100% cotton, not nearly the nightmare of the 100% rayon stuff that I've sewn on this channel before, but this does require a special setup. So if you decide to try it, you know, you're going to have to adjust back your upper tension so you don't have it continuing to break on you. You're going to have to increase your bobbin case pull just a little bit more to get a nice balance of stitching. And you're going to have to get that sweet spot on the presser foot pressure so that you're getting a nice feed, assuming you're going to be sewing with cotton material uh, if you're doing some sort of quilting. Oh, there we go. So, and again, this thread is, the customer thought, Julie thought it was 40 weight. It's actually closer to 30 weight. So you're just going to have to get the right machine set up if you want to try this stuff out. I think it's a nice thread. I even think the rayon stuff is a nice thread, but it just requires setting the machine up in a, in a particular way. So <clears throat> I don't have a lot of other sew-offs that I prepared because I realized that this would run late. And I knew that some of the folks that are really committed were in the earlier live stream as well. And they're in it again. It's going on 8.30. It's past 8.30 in Wisconsin. So it's 9.30 on the West Coast, on the East Coast, excuse me. It's 9.30 on the East Coast. It's 10.30, going on 10.30 in Brazil. And I don't know if we have other international folks that are a part of the live stream or not, but it, it may be moving into the wee hours in the morning, depending on where they are. So I do want to try to wrap this up, but I wanted to show you, really what I wanted to show you is I wanted to re-celebrate the featherweight and also do it in a way that showed you that any machine has the potential for greatness. Again, please, 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 Go to the, I'm not going to have it up right at the end of the live stream, but hopefully before the evening is out, I'll get all of those links for the progress shots. If you don't do Facebook regularly, I'll put them in the description for this live stream. And then you can look at what this machine looked like when it came to the workshop. Oh my gosh. If when Julie watches this, she's going to be like, I can't believe that that's the same machine, but I know it is because it looks so much different than when it came to the workshop with that crustiness, that nasty crustiness and the dull finish and the clear coat was just chipped up and it just looked awful. It didn't look like a princess of singers. Now she does. And that was a big deal. I know to Julie because she was making an investment to bring it to the workshop with high hopes. And I didn't, you know, I I'm always very confident in what I do but when you're interacting with original paint, you might get the result that you want 100%. You might get 90% in some cases, especially when you're dealing with some of the, 
the paint patinas on the FOF machines when you're trying to restore the finish on a FOF machine because of the type of enamel paints that they use it becomes even more of a challenge to bring back the beauty of that machine. But hopefully, you know, as you're looking at Julie's machine, you're going, are you kidding me? That thing is drop dead, drop dead gorgeous. It truly is. I'm trying to get the right angle to show you guys. And then when you look at the before shots, because I know a lot of you folks, you love to see before after, right? And I'm bummed out that for whatever reason, the internets that that I was trying to access and supply to look up those those pictures and pull them up is different than what we're streaming with. I'm using two different internet providers, uh, and uh, the streaming's working great. I hope I hope it's working great on your end. It seems to be. Uh, but the internet I was trying to use to pull those pictures up, it was just <clears throat> nope, don't want to do it, don't want to do it. But I'll put those links in there, and then any of you that want to look at them, can look at them, please do that. Cause you'll be like, Holy mackerel. Is there hope for my featherweight? My featherweight has some of the same shortcomings that Julie's did with that crusty, nasty, flat finish. It just looked awful. And if Scott can do, you know, do to my machine, what he did to hers with the original paint, the original decals, there's hope for my machine. I always think there's hope. Don't you? I think there's always greatness waiting in the wings for any sewing machine. There's always greatness waiting in the wings for any sewing machine. So if you have a machine that you, you know, at, at some point or another, you thought it was hopeless. You may have, you may have even gone into someone that does something similar to what I do in restoring machines. And they said, don't waste your money. It's hopeless. You're not going to be able to get that featherweight back to a point where it's going to be, it's going to have the majesty. It's going to have the majesty of that featherweight like it did when it left the factory. Don't you believe those people for a second? Don't believe them. Don't believe them for a second. Julie was told something similar to that by a wannabe restorer, that this machine could not come back to its majesty. What do you guys think? Type in the live chat if you're part of the live chat right now. Do you think that this machine has its majesty back? I've got my opinion, but I also put a lot of time into it as well. But never lose hope in your vintage sewing machines. And if you want to take grandma's machine and get it to an heirloom quality, a machine that if the Smithsonian looked at it, they would say, oh, my goodness, gravy. Yes, 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 yes. We would like to have grandma's machine and put it on display at the Smithsonian. That's the level of work that I can give you. Now, there's an investment involved for sure. But if you want an heirloom piece for your family and you have a crusty machine like you'll see in those pictures, but you want it to look like Julie's does now, I'll do that for you. And I've done that for a number of folks. And if you, and if you do Facebook, go to the landing page of the Cow Country page and you'll see Brad Stuman's before and after pictures of his red eye, his class 66 red eye, where it went from a beastly machine, a beastly, nasty looking machine to an absolute work of art that he now has in the foyer to his home, where when he, he and his wife do a lot of entertaining down in Tennessee. And he has that machine that I restored for him center stage as they walk into the foyer and they look at that beautiful table where that machine is sitting. It's not a sewing table. It's a bigger table with like a, 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 I think a bouquet of flowers behind it. It's kind of a centerpiece table. If that makes sense. I'm not a better homes and gardens guy, but I know beauty when I see it and the way they have it set up with that backdrop of fresh flowers and that class 66 that I restored for him in the foreground. When people walk in, They've got a mop nearby because they start drooling. They start drooling as they look at Brad's machine. And you can go to the Facebook page for Cow Country and look at that. It's the first thing on the page as you go there. And a lot of people have gotten excited about, over that. And that's why they've come to me because they're like, other people can't restore it to that level, to that greatness level, but you can. And that's what I wanted to give Julie without replacing the paint, without replacing the decals. And I... I hope I nailed it. I think I nailed it. I think I did. Yeah. So 
we could do a lot more sewing, but it's getting really late. You've seen the page 34 stitching on cotton. You've seen this machine mow through two layers of saddle grade leather, even though I didn't have the presser foot pressure set really well on it. So I'm going to wrap things up and take a look at the chat, see if there's anybody that I, I need to say hello to, anyone that I haven't interacted with. I'll kind of turn this machine so you can look at it straight on a little bit more. Also, just to let you guys know this, I'm going to move that stitch length back. Another basic need that a lot of featherweights, featherweights run into is the rubber feet that go on the bottom. I'm hopefully not going to tip this over too far. The little rubber feet that go on the bottom of these machines, folks will have these. They're all gnarly. They're torn off. Sometimes they have three of these on instead of four. These are available aftermarket now. You can find them on eBay. You can find them on Etsy. And uh, you'll definitely want to consider looking that up. If, if you've got some worn down rubber feet where your machine is got it, getting a lot more vibration, it just isn't, it isn't uh, as, you know, it's not as, as, as smooth as this one is because it's got a really, you know, it's all about the platform, right? It's about having a good solid foundation. It's got a good solid foundation now since I replaced all those rubber feet. They're not that expensive, uh, not excessively expensive for that matter. And it makes all the difference in the world of taking that vibration factor and giving your machine a nice solid platform to set. So that's just one of the other things I did. I also added this little rubber boot, which Julie may decide she doesn't like, but I added this little rubber boot to that uh, uh, screw in uh, that screw or whatever that holds the faceplate on. On the featherweight, there's only one screw that holds the faceplate on. And I put that little boot on there because inevitably, when people are raising and lowering this uh, bed, they might get a little bit anxious and they'll flip it up real quick. And then all of a sudden you have metal hitting that painted surface. So this just creates a little bit of a, a buffer in between. And I have it angled intentionally like that. So it's not making a flat contact with the paint where it might mar the paint. Even with, even with rubber, it's offset a little bit. So it creates a nice cushion on there to protect that bed from getting scratched. Because that's the last thing Julie wants to have happen after investing in this machine to get it back to a point where it's it's uh, really a showpiece. She doesn't want to accidentally flip that bed up and damage that beautiful uh, patina. So there you go. Well, thank you again to everyone. Thank you to Emma for being our, our translator for Christina from Brazil. We always want folks to feel welcome. That's really the, the cornerstone of cow country is we want folks to kick your shoes off Kind of like y'all remember that that program that was on TV way back in the day called Beverly Hillbillies. And these folks ended up striking oil. They went to Beverly Hills. They got a beautiful mansion, but they never lost their identity. They were always good, wholesome country folks, even in the midst of Beverly Hills. And their thing on the and their theme song or whatever was kick your shoes off. Y'all come back. You hear? That's kind of like the cow country thing as well. We want y'all to kick your shoes off, put your bunny slippers on. Get your PJs on and join us and relax and learn together. We all learn from each other. I always say it again and again and again, but I'm going to say it again, especially for my friends on Facebook, those sewing savants that create their little groups and want everybody to believe that they have all the answers. That's a bunch of, in my opinion, no one has all the answers. I learn from all of you. You learn from me. It makes us better. We're sometimes teachers. We're always what? Type it in the chat if you're a regular. We're sometimes teachers. We're always what? Type it in the chat. Come on, somebody type. Sometimes a teacher always, 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 always. We're always students, aren't we? We're always learning. And it goes back to a quote that I shared when I when I went through and we, we announced the winner of the essay contest yesterday, I think it was. I lose track. Or the day before yesterday. I quoted Aristotle. And I don't want to bore you guys with all kinds of philosophical mumble jumble. But Aristotle was a pretty smart dude. And he said, 
the truly wise person, the truly smart person realizes their intelligence is a drop of water, their ignorance in ocean. Our intelligence is a drop of water, our ignorance is an ocean, but our drops become bigger when we humble ourselves and we come into a setting like this and we learn from each other. We get bigger drops. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So y'all have a great evening. Thank you so much for sticking it out. This went a lot longer than I planned and we didn't do as much sewing on this featherweight, but you, you can tell straight away if a machine is running tip top. And you can look at those stitches and you can say page 34, bang on. Whether we're sewing saddle grade leather, whether we're sewing cotton with a stiffener, without a stiffener, this machine is ready to go to work for Julie. So I know she's excited and she'll be incredibly excited to see what I've done with the look of the machine too. That's that's kind of the, the icing on the cake, isn't it? Yeah. All right. You guys have a great evening. I'm going to uh, end the live stream pretty quick, but I'm going to put on some music first. And y'all can chat a little bit more if you want. If you're still in the shadows, that's okay. Eventually, you'll step out of the shadows and join the live chat. And we will celebrate that day when you do that. Because a lot of our folks, including Emma now, Emma, who is translating from Portuguese to English, from English back to Portuguese, she's acting now as a moderator on the channel. Guess what? Emma, for the longest time, for the longest time, Emma and Paula, who's a moderator, and Veronica, and Bill, and Sonny, all of these folks sat in the shadows for a long time before they finally came out and they said, okay, I want to get involved now in the chat. I want to share things. I want to ask questions. I want to share answers. Because again, we're all learning from each other, right? Isn't that the cool thing about our classroom? Yeah. And speaking of that, I'll try to remember to do this more often, but I forget. <laughs> Class is dismissed, but if you want to hang out for a little bit, that's cool too. So hopefully you found this helpful. Hopefully you had fun. Hopefully you met some new people. And, uh, you know, as you feel comfortable, share your knowledge with us as well. It's only going to make us better. It's only going to make us better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's a fun one. Carol Ann, 126666. Carol Ann, welcome to Carol Ann as well. Nice. Very cool. All right, how about some music? Music, maestro. Music. Hopefully I don't crash this computer over here. Come on, come on. Blah, 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 blah. Kind of mellow. I want something peppy. Give me peppy. Oh, I like this one too. In the sweet by and by. Let's crank this up a little bit. fun song, isn't it? I'm going to put one more on because folks are still interacting and I don't want you all to feel rushed. And the live, stat the live chat stays active for a little bit after I end the stream, but it, it times out. I have no control over that. I'd leave it on for a while if I could, but I can't. So we'll just kind of stretch this out a little bit. Folks that need to leave, I totally understand. Folks that want to hang around for just a little bit, 
Hang around. Kick your shoes off. Y'all come back. You hear? Yeah. That's fun. Tenacity and perseverance. So you guys see the way the machine looks right now, right? And again, this is original paint, original decals. I did conditioning on the paint. I re clear coated it, kind of built the surface back up. I was able to open up that other one. Y'all, if you're still hanging in there, that's awesome. Hold on a second. This is how the machine looked before. Paint, isn't that awful? Ooh, ah! Now that compared to hold on, hold on, wait for it. That <laughs> yes, <laughs> all right, let's keep going. I'm so excited that I can show this to you. I'll still post the pictures, but now you can see the before after. Oh my goodness. Yikos. See that? And that's where the clear coat has broken down. And the, there's a lot of varnishing on there. A lot of varnishing. Look at that. And again, you compare it to what you see now. So don't lose hope in your machine. Look at all that rust and varnishing up there. Don't lose hope in your machine. Oops, I'm getting crazy with my clicking here. I'm click crazy. See that? Now you can see that, the quality of that. That's not complimentary of a princess of singers. It's not. But that's how Julie's machine looked when it came to the workshop. That's how it looked. See that? That's kind of spooky, isn't it? And then we go from that with a little bit of workshop, paint shop magic. To that. So never lose hope. Never, 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 never lose hope in your machine. If your machine is all crusty and the paint 
is real rough like this, like you're seeing right here, I can make it better. You just have to get it to the workshop. But you can imagine how even up here, and then they had these stickers all over the machine from the previous owner who lived in, I know nothing. I know nothing about Florida other than uh, Emma and uh, and uh, Mad Madeline. Yeah, Madeline. Um, Maddie, Maddie, Madeline uh, are from Naples, Florida. I know about that. Um, I know that Paula is from uh, West Palm Beach or something like that. I don't know where Vera Beach is, but this lady was so proud of the fact that she was on Ocean Drive Apartment 402A, Vera, Vera or Vera Beach, Florida, 32963. She had these stickers like stuck to the paint. I mean, as if someone stole her featherweight, they wouldn't be able to peel it off like I did. I, I don't know. I don't know. But it was her featherweight if that's what she wanted to do with it. But just the general cleanliness of the machine. I'll put all these. I'll put all of these. But when the machine comes in and it's serviced, it's not just a matter of making it look pretty again. It's also getting all of that dirt and varnishing and all that junk off of the machine that's holding it back. And this was all right in proximity to the motor. And the motor acts like a vacuum cleaner, so it sucks all this junk in. And then it starts to take that point, point 0.4 amp motor, and it steals the energy and the power away from it. So that this motor had like little or no power when it got to the workshop. But today we buzzed through two layers of saddle grade leather without a hand start. And the machine just went. Broop. Of course, yeah, I screwed up on the presser foot pressure. So the stitches weren't spot on. But but you get rid of all this dirt and you tear the motor down like I do. And all of a sudden the machine gets a new gulp of air, a new breath. Look at all the by the presser foot. This is right above the raceway. All that junk on there. Look at that pulley. That pulley for the motor is all rusted. The belt is shot. The motor is filthy. How is it gonna? How is it gonna have a good day? It's not gonna have a good day. That's all rust. And then we've got that beautiful hundredth anniversary centennial badge mark, and even that looks dingy. And this is all chipped up, and this is all filthy. That's not a princess of singers. Look at that. Now you can look at that and comparatively. There we go. Now I'm aiming in the right direction. It is the same machine. It really is. It's the same featherweight that came into the workshop. But my special talent my special determination my raw grit said this machine has greatness waiting and you guys saw that greatness today how cool is that look at all that junk in there that's all caramelized old grease grease has an expiration like anything it's like leaving cottage cheese in your refrigerator for a year and then popping it open and hoping that it still tastes good ah no so all of that has to be cleaned up. And then I put my special pink grease on there. And the folks that just jumped into that essay contest, uh, they're going to they're gonna be one of the first people in the history of Cal Country that get a sample of that pink grease. The, the, the three runner-ups uh, that were selected. Yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, that, ugh, yuck. Nasty. That's where our, our tensioner is. I showed you when you come through there up to the bobbin, when you're winding a bobbin, look at all that filth. Look at the inside of that face plate. Such an intricate part with a needle bar, the presser foot bar, all the other mechanics coming off of the main shaft in conjunction with the upper tension that was also filthy right above the raceway. And it was just, ugh, yeah. A lot of filth. And this is all holding the machine back, you guys. It all holds the machine back. And I have some people that I respect greatly that will say to me, and, and they might do similar work to what I do, and they'll say, Scott, do you really have to get it? Do you have to get it that clean? That's actually better the other way. Do you really have to get it that clean? 
Yeah, you do. Because dirt and varnishing is holding that machine back. This is all varnishing and dirt and grime buildup in there. Look at the top of that light assembly where a combination of varnishing and the clear coat being compromised. We're all the way down to bare paint here. That's all the way to bare paint. Look at it now. That's the original paint. That's the original paint. That's the original decal. But a special process that I go through of reconditioning that surface and then taking it through the paint shop and re-clear coating it and doing it in stages. It's not a rushed process. It takes days. Building that back up again, layer by layer by layer by layer by layer. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it looks like it's brand new again, doesn't it? That compared to that. So like I say, don't lose hope in your vintage machine. Don't have somebody that's a, you know, one of those sewing savants on Facebook that you send pictures to and they go, oh yeah, that machine is, that machine is shot. Can't do a thing with that. Just, just use it the way it is. But you're wanting it to be a showpiece. Don't buy that, that story from these folks that have good intentions, but are misleading people into what the, possible greatness factor is of a machine that is just waiting you know to have the opportunity to be great again just waiting you can see the rust on the inside of that bobbin as well same thing on the inside this is the original bobbin case that i wanted to preserve but the screw adjuster on the side was stripped out and there's nothing you can do about that at that point there's no way to adjust that bobbin tension uh, because that screw will not stay fixed. The vibration, even though the machine has very little vibration, it works it loose and it throws the tension off. See that? That's all rust. See how plain Jane the bottom of that extension bed is too. I won't flip it up right now, but it's it's beautiful again. It's beautiful again. Another one of those stickers. One of you should send this. She's probably passed away. I, I don't. I don't mean that irreverently. I mean that with absolute respect. But you know, she wanted everybody to know where she lived. Maybe because she was on Ocean Drive. Maybe that's. Maybe that was a fancy house or something. I have no idea. See all the filth, and that's right next to the raceway. Lots of filth. And there's our raceway right there. This has to come apart. That all has to come apart because there's all kinds of buildup behind there where that thread works its way through and the magical process of that needle sweeping down, that hook coming around, that thread gets caught up in there with all that junk. It has to be cleaned, has to be torn down. See all that? Look at that filth. Especially down here. Hopefully you can see that. The lighting might be throwing it off a little bit, but it's just a filthy mess. And that's the... You guys know this. I call that the brain center. That's the brain center of the sewing machine right there. And there I'm trying to get that upper tension out to, to uh, tear it down and to clean it properly. And that the, the, the screw that holds it in place has never been taken out. It's just fused in there. So I'm using my torch very carefully to loosen that up to get it out so I can tear that down. You go to a sewing back place, they're never going to take your upper tension out and tear it all the way down and clean it properly. They're going to probably swab through the discs if they do that, but it, it's not enough. It's not enough. There's that beautiful badge mark right there celebrating 100 years of the Singer Sewing Machine Company, 1851 to 1951. And what a great celebration that had to have been. I wish I had a time machine, don't you? And that was the cool thing about at the opening to this, if you joined us late, at the opening of it, I showed some original video at the Chicago World's Fair back in 1933-34 when this featherweight was first introduced to the world. That was the first introduction of the featherweight to the world was at the Chicago World's Fair back in 1933-34. Can you imagine how exciting that was? How exciting that was. And then a couple decades later or so to then have another big 
centennial celebration. Again, the Chicago World's Fair theme was century of what? Does anybody remember? Century of what? Starts with a P. Looking at the chat, I'm looking at the chat. I see that Emma was talking with Christina, but no one's jumping in. It's right at the beginning of this. And what it talks about is century of progress. Progress. You could you could substitute progress with innovation. But it was a huge, the Chicago World's Fair was a huge celebration of all the innovations that had come about over the last hundred years leading up to that event in 1933-34. And then for Singer, just a short time after that, to be able to celebrate their 100th birthday in 1951. And I'm not a mathematician, but you can do the math from 34 until 51, whatever that comes out to be, less than two decades, I guess, huh? They were able to celebrate another 100-year milestone. How cool is that? Very cool. Trying to get that pulley off of the... uh, Output shaft on the motor now, so I can clean that. These are what I was talking about. You can replace those feet on the bottom of the featherweights. You can do the same thing with the 301s, uh, the big sister to the featherweight. They've got rubber feet replacements for those. You don't want to be operating the machine like this. Someone was, because this is providing no, no foundation for that machine at all. You're getting a lot of vibration. The the machine is probably off kilter a little bit. It might even be rocking, rocking a little bit, depending on the surface that you're trying to use it on. Just go on to eBay or go to uh, uh, Etsy maybe, and they sell these replacement feet for the featherweight. There's only a single bolt. That bolt might be a little bit difficult to get out, but you can work that bolt loose and then replace that foot. Have four beautiful brand new feet on it, just like I did for Julie. It's not a featherweight. That's a 201 dash two. What is that doing in there? <laughs> I don't know why I did that. That is so weird. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Uh, but you can hear even from a distance, you can see that paint surface again. It's all chalky. The clear coat is compromised. You're down to bare paint. Look at this. Compared to that. I think Julie's going to be happy. I hope she is. Yeah, I think she'll be happy. Yeah. Well, you guys have a great night. You've been so attentive. You all get an A in the class. Everyone gets an A. And uh, thank you again to all those that felt comfortable to step out into the live chat. We love welcoming you, as as I saw Emma uh, say the same thing. You know, we love having new folks uh, join the classroom. It's so much fun. We learn together and we get a chance to see great machines like this that weren't so great when they got to the workshop. But after a lot of TLC and a little bit of workshop magic and paint shop magic as well, uh, we have a machine that can now step out and do its featherweight strut again. I would love to. All these people are doing TikTok videos. I'm not on TikTok. A couple of people have said I should come up with something clever sewing related to put on TikTok. I haven't come up with anything clever yet, but they're always doing these TikTok videos. I'd like to come up with a way to animate a featherweight and have a featherweight. Initially, it's kind of dragging its leg. You know what I mean? It's dragging its crippled little legs that are all gnarly on the bottom. And then it goes through the workshop. And then the TikTok TikTok video shows it doing a featherweight strut, you know, kind of going across like, yeah, baby. Yeah. Look at me. Look at me. You know, that's that's the coolness about the workshop, isn't it? Any machine can have greatness. It just takes a little bit of time, talent, and persistence. So with that, I think that's the last picture. Maybe we'll have another picture of the 201. (laughs) Yeah, that's just more pictures of showing you how bad the paint was. Yeah, you already saw that. So y'all have a great evening. Have a good night's rest wherever you are in the world. And uh, oh, welcome to Renee as well. Welcome to Renee. Yeah, welcome to Renee. And uh, again, thanks to Christina for, for joining us from Brazil. Thank you to Emma for doing all the translation stuff. And I'm going to end the live stream now. And I'm going to go have dinner or lunch or whatever it is at this hour. 
in Wisconsin this after nine o'clock. So maybe it's like a liner. Is that what they call it when you're mixing? You didn't have lunch, you didn't have dinner, and then you finally have a late dinner. It's liner, right? I think it's liner, L-I-N-N-E-R, something like that. I have no idea. But everybody have a great night. Good night to, uh, oh, Doris Trussell as well. Welcome to Doris Trussell. Uh, welcome to Stephen. Lupper, I like Lupper better. Lupper is more fun than Liner. I'm going to use Lupper from now on. But it's kind of like li liposuction. You know, you have too much Lupper, then you need lipos. Ah, whatever. I like Lupper. I'll use Lupper. So welcome to Stephen, Christina, Emma, and everybody else. You guys are the greatest. I love you. And have a great evening. Thanks for joining. Uh, I will crank on a little bit of music. The 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 we're officially done. We're officially done. So if you need to step away, step away. But I'm going to put on a little bit of music now. That I thank God I was able to get those pictures to load, so you could see you could see Hank. That's I just have this open to play music too. Yeah, Hank Hank is such a cool guy. He's a cool guy. He's upstairs right now, and he's actually quiet. Dance with the Fireflies. That's a good song to end to, maybe. Yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. So good. Oh my gosh, these are so good. until the end of the song and then I'm going to end the live stream. So if you're wondering how long it's going to go when the song ends, we're done. I don't know how much time we have left. Good night, everybody. God bless.